Good evening, all. My name is Kyle Whittington. And if you saw the title, you saw the thumbnail. Yeah, I'm a little upset here. So, yes, as the title says, uh, Michael Lofton has been stealing. Lately on his channel, he's been uh, he's been responding to like these low hanging fruit, like these these guys a, a little bit. He's not looking out for like anybody but himself. And, you know, it, it's really got me upset a little bit um, because like this low hanging fruit is like kind of my thing. And he's uh, he's encroaching in on my turf. And uh, I just got to say that there's really only one thing to say about this. And one, it's that Michael Lofton is a problem and there's only one thing to do. And that is to uh, bring him onto the show and uh, do one of these with him. So, Michael, thanks for taking the time to come join me. <laughs> Kyle, let me just start out by apologizing to you for encroaching on your territory. I do apologize for stealing. I know that's it's a violation of one of the commandments, and, and I do want to apologize for that. I can see that that is entirely your territory. Uh, so. <laughs> you know, it's turf that I'm happy to give up because if anybody in here, <laughs> you jump scare. So, uh, yeah, no, so this is... Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a joy to have you on. And like, hey, if you got... If, and this is just like one of those things too. Like uh, just before that we started uh, rolling, I, I wanted to just kind of say that like these low hanging fruit things are mm -hmm. still worth addressing. And, you know, we agree on this because like yeah. out on the street, this is where the, this is where the level is. So yeah. Yeah. You know, for a while I kind of wrestled with that because a few years ago I, I, I did some videos kind of addressing some of the low hanging fruit content that, that is out there. And some people are like, Oh, you're just picking on, you know, easy targets. And well, I've engaged, you know, I think stronger representatives from Protestantism as well, but I kind of understood where they're coming from. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, there's just so many people out there that this is just kind of where they're at. They, when you go and talk to the average Protestant, their arguments aren't necessarily the best that Protestants have to offer. They're more the kind of low hanging fruit content. So I actually think that it is productive in addressing this stuff, even though to us it might sound ridiculous, but in reality, this is where a lot of people are. And so that's kind of where we have to meet them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And just like I said, before the camera started rolling, the fish in this barrel deserve to be shot. So yeah. Yeah. let's, yeah. let's not do any more gun analogies for fear of, uh, you know, getting demonetized. But uh, so anyway, as you see on the screen, we've got two mics and a red shirt. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've got Mike Gendron here. He's been getting a lot of attention lately, which is something that I'm honestly <clears throat> glad to see uh, because I feel like he's been uh, he's been getting away with this for a little too long. So, uh, you know, with the uh, I don't know, let's just get right into it. So he's oh, a former and, he's a former Catholic, right? You know, he claims to be, and I, I really don't have any evidence to suggest that he's lying, but like some of the things that he said is just like, <sighs> it's, one it's of the so basic. Yeah. It, well, it's so basic. And I guess I, and I, I've kind of well, defended him a little bit mm -hmm. cause like, you know, whenever he apostatized, it was, it was pre-internet. So he couldn't just go to YouTube to like find these answers a little bit. So mm -hmm. maybe he just didn't know, yeah. but like, in the 30 years that he's been doing this with right. the internet, it's just like y your excuses have really kind of run out. Yeah, the, I, I certainly think so. Even, even though I would say even prior to the advent of the internet, I, I don't know if that alleviates all the culpability here, but, <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying. But yeah, I listened to quite a few videos from Gendron and um, I, I don't know if it's Gendron or Gendron. Gendron. It was Gendron, but I've, I've listened to quite a yeah. few of the videos where he's presenting against Catholicism. And um, I noticed some really, really terrible arguments against Catholicism. And I did kind of wonder, how is this possible that he's a former Catholic and yet he's producing this kind of apologetic? So, yeah. 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 No, actually, uh, I, I think it was just yesterday, uh, Joe Heschmeyer over on Shameless Popery uh, mm -hmm. did a did a fantastic uh, analysis mm -hmm. of one of Mike's videos. So uh, if y'all aren't go, go over to shameless Popery, like subscribe there. It's great, great, great mm -hmm. stuff. So but anyway, let's go ahead and get started here. Let's do it. And when the Lord saved me out of the Roman Catholic church, I recognized very quickly that there's only two things in this life that are eternal. And that's the word of God and the souls of men. So I guess, 
I guess this is one of those like nitpicking, and you can correct me on this, but it's just like mm-hmm. there's only two things that are eternal, and that's the word of God and the souls of men. But it's just like, well, I mean, wouldn't the soul be more everlasting and eternal? Although that may be a stupid nit- nitpick. But I get, yeah, I think yeah. I, I know what you're saying because I mean, the soul isn't eternal because it, it, it hasn't always, you know, pre existed mm-hmm. or something from an eternity past. But I, I get what he's trying to communicate. I guess he's trying to say that it endures um, in, in the way that you just said, everlasting. Yeah, I mean, that could just be just him misspeaking and, you know, just talking off the cuff. Sure. Okay. So let's yeah. keep going. And so I wanted to spend the rest of my life in those two areas, abiding in God's word so I could share it with those who are perishing. And I look at the Roman Catholic mission field as one that's very neglected. And for that reason, praise God for that. It's been our pleasure to equip the body of Christ to be effective witnesses to the 1.3 billion Roman Catholics in the world today. And actually, I I, want to do, I do want to put a quick note on that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that is something that like kind of gets under my skin, although it's understandable why they're doing this. If you think the Catholic church is evil, yeah, you need to be evangelizing there. Like that is, yeah. Yeah. If it has a false gospel. Sure. 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 Uh, so like I, that is understandable, but like, um, you know, I, I, I talked to my mother-in-law recently, like she was donating to some Protestant mission group and they said like, you know, we're in South America Mm-hmm. And like I pointed out to her, like they're 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 missionaries in a Christian nation, yeah. And she's like, well, yeah, was, you know, whatever. But it's like they're literally like, quote unquote, evangelizing Catholics. Like they're trying yeah. to get people out of Catholicism, yeah. And you know, so it's just like I I I do want to just like put that note out there, like, hey, y'all, like take take note of this because you know. Yeah, it it reminds me of a local Baptist church of mine who send missionaries to Ireland, and it's kind of laughable given that, yeah, Ireland has Catholics there. Not that uh, we couldn't improve on some of the quality of Catholicism there in Ireland. Sure. You you don't necessarily have to evangelize them to Christ, uh, given that already there's still a Catholic culture there. What we need to do is just call them to be faithful to their Christian and Catholic roots. Um, but yeah, I, I understand where, where he's coming from, Mike, that is. Uh, if Catholicism has a false gospel and is damning souls, uh, yeah, okay, I understand that that would be a field to evangelize, but that's exactly the point of contention. And and I just find it a little absurd, given that he wouldn't even have Christianity if it wasn't for Catholicism. So, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's keep going. I mean, he's going to evangelize us. Oh. He's going to evangelize us with the Bible, and of course, it's yeah. going to be a particular version of the canon. But even the canon that he has. The New Testament canon that he has is not necessarily native to Protestantism and originated in a context of Catholicism. And so it, what he's going to evangelize us with is is more native to us than it is to him. In his yeah. Life. You know, it's it's actually funny. I like I really appreciate like the work of, you know, Jeff Cavins and Father Mike Schmitz with the mm-hmm. Bible in a year, because that accusation of Catholics don't read the Bible or Catholics don't want you to read the Bible. Mm-hmm. Like that whole line is just gone the only people who could say that with a straight face now is just like you just have no idea what's happening yeah and you know you'll notice there he's just saying that he wants to reach catholics with the message of the bible we we already have the bible (laughs) yeah we have it (laughs) there's nothing that you're going to reach us with that we don't already have but what it is is He's trying to reach us with a particular interpretation of the Bible, not necessarily with the Bible, because we already have the Bible, but again, with a particular spin on it. And that's the point of contention, the spin that he's putting on Scripture, um, on the nature of justification or just salvation in general, is an innovation. It's a tradition of men, and it nullifies the Word of God. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's carry on here. Mm -hmm. There's a gray line between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. It used to be black and white 500 years ago, but unfortunately we've got some evangelical leaders now that are signing unity accords with Catholics. So a lot of people are confused. They don't know if the Catholic church represents a huge mission field or if it's a Christian denomination that. Yeah. So, you know, 
I, I actually think it's one of my favorite documents to reference, and I've never heard you speak on this, but like the the joint declaration of the doctrine of justification. Mm -hmm. I point to that a lot whenever people say like, oh, you know, the Catholic Church wants to move away from faith alone. But then then like that document like kind of states of like, hey, actually, like you can you can you can formulate it to where we're close. It's not mm -hmm. as different as you think that we are. Um, but mm -hmm. I know he's complaining about that because it's, he, it seems like he's saying that uh, he doesn't like the fact that uh, some people consider Catholics Christians. Uh, well, yeah, it all depends on then how we're defining terms. But notice that he uh, doesn't want to see us as a denomination. Although, again, mm -hmm. we, we would claim we're more than just one denomination among many. But uh, from his perspective, he's saying we're, we don't even constitute a de denomination. And my problem here is that he has, as a Protestant, he has absolutely no way to identify what is an essential doctrine to then mm -hmm. distinguish it from non-essential doctrines to then determine what is a denomination versus what is a heretical group. Um, so there, I, I don't even know how he could speak about denominations from his perspective since he doesn't have a magisterium. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I, I recently learned that, you know, the line of like, uh, like, Oh, you know, Protestants didn't get rid of the Pope. You know, they, they crowned themselves the Pope. And I found out recently that that line like actually like originated with Luther. Like, so it's just like, that's not like anti-Protestant Catholic propaganda. Like that's like straight from the horse's mouth on that. So well, ultimately it's, it's putting oneself in, in their conscience in the driver's seat. Um, yeah. Whereas in the Catholic church, we we're we're going to yield our assent to the teaching authority of um, the magisterium be, because it originates in the authority of Christ. Um, so that that's the fundamental difference. So for us, we're able to distinguish between what is heresy versus what is orthodox, and thus we can determine, okay, what is Christian, what is what is not Christian. Um, but for them and their perspective, since it's ultimately going to de be determined based on his particular interpretation of sacred scripture, uh, yeah, he might, well, although in his case, I don't think he'll look at the church fathers, but some Protestants might say, well, I'll look at church fathers, I'll look at... Councils. Yeah, but at the end of the day, it's going to be their private interpretation that is ultimately what reigns supreme. Um, since that's the case, how, how can you really even speak of denominations aside just from your your personal opinion? Yeah, at, at that point, we're we're talking about ecclesiology according to Mike, which then yeah. my my immediate question is, okay, cool. Like I can see that you've got this system here. Now the question is, why should I take you seriously? Right, who sent you? You know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, you, you mentioned the church fathers. He's mentioned in other videos that like he refuses to read the early church fathers because he's just like, well, you know, that those are they, they would be the apostates then. And, and he refuses to read them. And, okay. uh, and it's just like, OK, but then but then he starts talking about the beliefs of the early church. And he's like, hold on. What, why are you talking about the beliefs of the early church whenever you just told us that you will not read the early church? Right. But but you'll notice the curious thing here is that. Whenever Catholics start to refute what's called solo scriptura, you know, hmm. some Protestants will retort, oh, that's that's a straw man. You know, we actually believe in sola scriptura, not solo scriptura. And so we do see other rules of faith out there as considerable. And OK, maybe there are some Protestants out there who do, but there are plenty of them who are solo scripturists. And yeah, that would be Mike Ginger. <laughs> so Ginger. that is actually a distinction that I've never quite understood before. Do you mind just making that distinction sure. real quick? Sola so and sola? Yeah. So what they're effectively saying is that with sola scriptura, scripture alone is infallible. It's the only infallible rule of faith. But there are other rules of faith, such as church councils and church fathers and and you know pastors and bishops okay. and so on but they're not an infallible rule of faith but they are a rule of faith um so that's sola scriptura solo scriptura basically says that scripture alone is infallible and it is the only rule of faith it's not only the only infallible rule of faith it's the only rule of faith you don't look to councils you don't look to church fathers you just look to you in your bible period mm. So there is a fundamental difference between sola scriptura and solo scriptura. I grant, but the problem is, is you'll find both among Protestants. Gotcha. 
Okay. And so whenever they try to say, oh, you're just straw man. No, no, because the solo script tourists are out there. We're, yeah. We're looking at one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, David's got a question here. And by the way, David, I did see the super chat. Thank you. Uh, just trying to keep the pace of the show going. But anyway, so uh, the quote about the not reading church fathers more about how do I know they weren't deceived like a de demonic deception. And you know what? Fair enough. But like, you got to test them. Like, you can't just like, oh, these people disagree with me. I'm just going to dismiss them out of hand. Like, if that's your rule of faith, is that like, if I like it, it's true. If I don't like it, it's not true. Uh, I mean, where are the we? So, the sola scriptura position makes more sense because at least they'll look at church fathers and councils. Yeah. They might not accept it as an infallible rule, but they'll consider it. It's like, mm. okay, I'll hear them out. All right, well, that's much more reasonable than somebody who says, I won't even hear them out. I'm not even going to mm. listen to the councils or church fathers. Yeah. They yeah. might be church demons. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. So hopefully in the testimony that I have to share about God's amazing grace in my life, that people will understand that there is a distinct difference between what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and what the Bible teaches. Yeah. Well, I you know, so I, I just, I've always wondered what people think the church did with the Bible for, you know, what is it, uh, for roughly the thousand years before Protestants came along. Like, TV didn't exist. We kept it chained and hidden, hidden from the faithful. And, and it's just like, okay. And then, like, you know, the church gave you the Bible, so that means... Like, if the church wanted to hide something, we just would have taken it out. Like, if we're so evil and so deceptive, we just would have removed that bit. It would not have been hard. So, yeah. Yeah, because ultimately, <clears throat> there's nothing in the Hebrew and Greek versions of the Old and New Testament that wasn't substantially preserved in the Vulgate translation as well. So even if you want to say like, well, the, the Vulgate translation that was being used, you know, substantially changes the meaning of Eustafakari or something like that. All of that is bunk anyway. So the same message is being preserved. So yeah, you, you raise a fair point. Why didn't we somehow remove these things from the Vulgate um, or from yeah. the Greek or Hebrew manuscripts that were still being preserved? Yeah, so yeah. 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 So like Dan's saying over here is like, yep, whoops, should have taken out all the bad verses. So, all right. Well, that, that, this is the thing. Obviously, we as Catholics have ways of interpreting um, the scriptures that they would try to present to us as problematic for our positions. Obviously, we have ways to interpret them that is consistent. You know, mm -hmm. it, it just always blows me away that some Protestants will present verses to Catholics as if we don't have Bibles and as if we don't have those verses. We're aware of them. Obviously, there's ways that we account for them in the same way that they will attempt to account for uh, James chapter 2 and other uh, verses there that you might find Catholics presenting to Protestants in um, apologetic circles. They, too, have ways that they can account for the books that they have, the proto-canonical verses and books. So ultimately, it's going, going to be a question of, okay, well, whose interpretation is proper? Yeah. Um, and, and, and so the question of authority and interpretation, that's ultimately where these debates really go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's one of the reasons, if not the main reason, that I'm so thankful for your ministry. I do love you as a friend, and I'm grateful for you as your brother, but you have this passion for reaching the hearts of people. You're not just trying to crush people and win arguments. Your goal is to win souls. If you watch the recent debate that uh, mm -hmm. debate that he did on Catholic truth, you can very I clearly tell he's not interested in winning arguments because he definitely didn't there. Yeah, I saw it. I mean, he, he didn't really interact a whole lot um, mm -hmm. with the Catholic position. Um, it seemed to it seemed to me, if I recall correctly, watched it about a week or so ago, um, that he was kind of hung up on the question of justification. Sure. If I recall correctly. And that's yeah. where I, I think that he could really be taken to task because 
um, his understanding of justification was very, very poor. And what was even worse was his understanding of the Catholic understanding of justification was mm -hmm. even worse. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. but I, th I feel like that's kind of where he, he tried to hang his hat. And I just thought, wow, this was really poor. By the way, yeah. I recognize the guy on the right, but I don't recall his name. Who Who is that? Costi Hinn. Got it. So that's uh, Benny Hinn's nephew, I think, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's his gotcha. Nephew. Okay, yeah. I didn't. I had no idea that that. You know, it's funny because like I actually sent these people an email uh, months back asking like, "Hey, I've 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 watched your video. Mm -hmm. I'm confused about what you're saying to Catholic about Catholicism, which mm -hmm. is not a lie. Like I'm very confused on why you would say this. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was just the question of if I were to leave Catholicism, where would you recommend that I go? And they just never responded to me. So they would tell you to go to Benny Hinn's concrete. No, not yeah. at all. Co yeah. Co Costi Hinn, he's, he's done some videos exposing his uncle. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. I tried to invite him on the show once, but I never got a response. Oh, fair enough. That's, it looks like you and I had the exact same, uh, exact same experience. So, oh, well, anyway, us, her us heretics are not worth responding to, I guess. Fair enough. <laughs> all right, let's keep going. Bowls. And you talk about the line between Roman Catholicism and Protestant Christianity. Would you please tell us how the Lord brought you across that line, what that journey was like? You went from being a devout Catholic to now being a very bold, for decades now, Christian preacher. Tell us about your testimony out of Catholicism. Well, Costi, it's really been a testimony of God's amazing grace in my life. Looking back, I can see him directing my steps and causing things to happen such that I would eventually open the Bible and realize how deceived I was. And it all starts back when um, I was born into a very devout Roman Catholic family. I was the second oldest of five children. My dad was an army colonel, so we traveled all over the world. And during my time as a Catholic, a young Catholic, I was an altar boy for seven years. And later... Oh, I've missed that part. Michael, he was an altar boy. I mean, that shows that he's legit. Oh, geez. Okay, that well. Must, that must mean he completely understood the Catholic position. Yeah, <sighs> I, I think so. Like that, that man, I didn't realize. Have, how have, have you ever noticed the, the quality and in, 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 the differences in the quality of converts um, from the two sides here? Um, the difference between those who are Catholic who end up going to Protestantism compared to those who are Protestant that go Catholic, just on the whole. I mean, there's always anomalies. But have you noticed a difference in quality there? I've heard the I've heard the maxim is basically like, you know, the Protestants get the worst Catholics, Catholics get the best Protestants. That's that's on the whole true. Obviously there's exceptions here and there, right? I mean, just I was an idiot when I converted. <laughs> <laughs> but painting painting with a broad brush here. Mm -hmm. That's that's on the whole true. And and yeah. I would just point that out here. Yeah. Yeah. So Later on as a Catholic, I began teaching high school Catholic Christian doctrine. So not only was I in a devout family, but I was also very devout, very religious. And so I recognized that uh, part of being a Catholic was to merit my way into heaven. And so I was. Okay. I just no. want to point that out real quick. No. That he said he was, he was, no. he was teaching high school. And that he was teaching that he had to work his way into heaven. So this guy just literally mm -hmm. admitted to teaching Pelagianism. In in, I I'm glad he's no longer teaching. I'm yeah. glad he left. <laughs> I can't say I'm glad he left the Catholic Church, but I'm at least glad he left that position. Yeah, uh, because I sure hope he wouldn't be teaching Catholics that. Um, yeah, you don't merit your way into heaven because in, in Catholicism we would know that as you as you pointed out there we're, we're not Pelagians that that first um that moment where we are transitioned from being a, a child of wrath to a child of god that initial moment of justification is not only entirely by grace it also has no merit because you in that moment you don't have any merit it's mm -hmm. in a moment it's it's completely by faith now it's a living faith it's not a dead faith it's not an ascent only even demons have that but it's a living faith but it's not one that has worked and merited anything because it's instantaneous it's an initial moment of justification so that initial moment 
is not meritorious. And that initial moment is the difference between going to hell versus going to heaven. So when you say meriting going to heaven, it already tells me you don't even understand the very beginning of justification. Now, if what you mean by that is meriting increases in justification or perhaps increases in your experience of God in heaven, what they would liken to as rewards, then sure, okay, that can be merited though not strictly speaking but it can be merited through god's grace but notice that's that's a greater experience that's a reward if you will mm -hmm. rather than meriting somehow that that initial transition period where i go from going to hell to now going to heaven we don't merit that so there's just a very basic misunderstanding on his part here so I guess yeah. being an altar boy didn't uh, help him out. Yeah. Oh, well, let's get it. I was doing everything I could do in order to make sure I made it to heaven. So I had a, a zeal for God, but it really wasn't. So it's, 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 he did everything that he could do except for, you know, actually listen to the church. So, right. which right. is something that we do ask, not, and, you know, yeah. Study, <laughs> study, study the faith. Yeah. Yep. I'm not surprised. Knowledge, <laughs> I had a, Actually, no, you, no, you're good. I was just saying, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. It, this is, it is pretty common. Whenever I hear people who leave Catholicism to go to Protestantism, it's generally because they lack a very basic understanding of the Catholic faith. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I, Mike talks slow enough that I actually increased the speed on this. Yeah. So let's see. Let's 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 go. Religion, but it didn't form into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry, that that that's a that's one of my biggest pet peeves whenever I mm. hear people uh go like, "Oh, it's a relationship, not a religion." I'm like, "Religion? Sorry, what does that mean? What what's the root of that word?" Oh, the Latin religare. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, it means relationship. Oh, okay. The, these kind of straw man arguments, it, it's They've been employed so many times that they're they're just worn out. It's it's time to move on to some other arguments against the Catholic Church. This is what is this one has just been beaten with you know yeah. over and over and over. So I mean, ultimately, yeah, you're 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 pointing out um, from the language there a good, a good point. But um, yeah, even even in Catholicism, we would stress that it's it's a personal thing. What what do they think that we believe that our relationship is entirely vicarious? So like somebody else has my relationship with God for me. Hmm. Who who is that person? I guess they're assuming it's the priest. Are they assuming the priest has the relationship of of you know between me and God? It's it's just the priest who has it or something. That's probably what he's assuming. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it's really interesting, um, and I don't have the catechism right offhand, but uh, a friend of, a, a buddy of mine and his wife recently converted to Catholicism, and one of the uh -huh. conversations that they had uh, was, she said, I don't want to be Catholic because I don't want to be too legalistic. And the uh, his question to her, okay, you don't want to be legalistic, that's a good, that's a good concern, mm -hmm. so tell me your definition of sin. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, uh, well, and then she gave like the legalistic definition. He goes, mm -hmm. now let me show you what's written in the Catholic catechism. And it was mm -hmm. like far more. And she, she read, she read the definition in the catechism and she goes, that's way better than my definition, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't have that definition off offhand, but you know, y'all can look it up, but, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is, it, a, this is atrocious. Yeah. Um, as, as if we don't have personal relationships with Jesus. Yeah. Um, that's not the issue. Obviously, do we do the question is what is the nature of that relationship? How do we come mm -hmm. to it? That that's kind of where the debate is. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. Let's 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 uh, see what other wisdom Mike would like to uh, bestow upon us. And I was sincere about what I believe, but I found out later I was sincerely wrong. And so for the first 34 years of my life, I was a very devout Catholic. Um I went to college and played baseball for the Raging Cajuns in Louisiana. And so during that time I Michael. Oh man, sorry, sorry, y'all. Yeah, and, and you know I'm what? Not, While we're I'm at not it, taking, I'm not taking any accountability for that. Well, you know what? There's somebody else in the chat that we can blame for it, though. Yeah, well, let's blame Father Brown. He's also yeah. from Louisiana. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because like he's not he's not caught up. 
Oh, no, never mind. I guess he is caught up. So never mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> Shout out Cajuns. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. yeah we're so, we're going to pin it, pin it on Father Brown. Yeah. It's all Father Brown's fault. <laughs> all right. Let's go. Remember during the Lent, you know, 40 days of Lent, I would literally go to Mass every day because I recognized God was a God that would look at my good works versus my sin. And hopefully I was building up enough good works that would outweigh my sin. God. So he was legit a Pelagian heretic. Goodness. Yeah. Like, how can you be in the 21st century a Pelagian? <laughs> like, <laughs> how is this possible? <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those things that like, I've legit tried thought about like, should I go try to like track down this guy's baptismal records? Because like, <laughs> Like what? Cause like, I, I don't know how you can, how you could believe that unless you're getting all of your, your information about Catholicism from Lorraine Bettner or something like that. Like, ugh. yeah. Yeah. I mean the council of Trent, it's justification session clearly condemns this understanding of, of Pelagianism. So I, and that would have been available to him even prior to the advent of uh, the internet. So there, there's just no excuse here. I'm still just shocked that, there could be in the 20th to 21st century a Pelagian who actually exists. It's, it's just like, wow. It's like, I'm amazing. sorry, did you just say that with a straight face? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, since he had such a poor understanding of Christianity, I could totally understand why he left the Catholic Church and embraced a message of God's grace. Now, it's not yeah. excusable. But yeah, if you're operating with a Pelagian view that you have to now earn God's favor and earn heaven, yeah, I would want to get out of that nightmare too. And if there was some Protestant who came to me and said, oh, well, God's grace is free. You don't have to merit it and you don't have to earn heaven. Jesus paid for you. Well, you're going to be attracted to that. But, yeah. you know, the, the reality is he had a false understanding of Catholicism, so he was just an easy target. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it, it's, you know, and I'll even like, I guess, like take it even one step further than that. Cause so it's like, okay, so we've already established, like he had these things available to him when he left, he's got much more available to him now. And, you know, like, uh, I, I, I guess Ian window. I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name, right. I'm sorry if I'm butchering that is saying he's like, no way, no one corrected him, but like, okay, let's just assume that he did that. You leave, you go to this grace filled church, you know, and you like it. And then I would even take it one step further. Like I would almost even understand after you were corrected, why you wouldn't want to come back because mm -hmm. you're settled. You don't want to move. Mm -hmm. The inexcusable thing to do mm -hmm. is that you've been corrected and yet you're still making a career out of attacking the church. Yeah. That's what really puzzles me. I could understand how he would be an easy target to snipe and for um, a, a Protestant missionary to kind of evangelize him. I could understand that initially, given how severely ignorant he, he was, but I don't understand after all of these years how he could still persist in this misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, it does seem to be, it, you would really have to wonder if it's willful at this point, if there are some <laughs> ulterior motives. Yeah. I, I generally don't question people's motives. I try to avoid that since it's generally hard to discern. But in this case, I, I don't know if there really is an excuse for this kind of ridiculous Pelagian presentation of, of Catholicism. He, he should know that, again, the Council of Trent has condemned this understanding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if, if it's not willful deception, it's willful ignorance, more than likely. More than likely. There's, there's a possibility there's something else going on there. So maybe. Yeah. But anyway, let's keep going. And I must say that I was a, a very sinful Catholic. I look back now and I realize. Hey, me too. I was in bondage to sin, and uh, I didn't have any power to be victorious over it. And well, so you know what? Um, he might still be. Um, and, he, and he mentioned how he was wrong. He was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. I would submit that he's still sincerely wrong. Mm. Um, and he said he was in bondage to sin as a Catholic. I would submit he might still be in bondage to sin. Um, mm. This kind of error and deficiency in, in an understanding of the faith is is one form of bondage to sin. So. I wouldn't rule it out as uh, an option for today. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. College, I, I was the greatest of sinners, but I thought as long as I'm going to mass, as long as I'm confessing and doing penance, that eventually uh, my good works would outweigh my sin. You know, I've heard this. I've heard this. Um, you know, this this complaint leveled before, and I've even heard it from my own mother before, prior to my own uh, 
conversion where like we were watching like CSI or something like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, a Catholic murdered somebody and then they went to confession. And my mom is over there like going like, oh, well, you know, them Catholics, they can do whatever they want. They just got to go to confession afterwards. And then like even as a Protestant, that didn't really sit right with me because I was just like, well, mom, but like as Protestants, can't we just do whatever we want and then just go straight to God and get forgiven? Like, don't we have fewer steps? And, and, you know, and like, it's like, that's just kind of like, I, I, I think we kind of believe that too, mom. And <laughs> the, the yeah. inconsistency there, but yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, yeah, you're, you're right to point out an inconsistency there, but of course, from the Catholic perspective, um, you you generally have to have a firm purpose of an amendment. You, you you really do have to be sorry for your sin. So if you're going to confession right. after murdering somebody and you you're not sincere in it, God does not forgive you. <laughs> hey, Father, while I'm here, can you go ahead and uh, forgive me for uh, the parents of the victim that I'm going to kill next weekend? <laughs> you know, it's like no, no, get out of here, get out of my confessional. Yeah. So anyway, all right. And so shortly after my college career, I went to Cape Kennedy, Florida, and I was a rocket scientist. I actually spent three and a half years there, and we were responsible for doing flight trajectories of all the missiles that took off from Cape Kennedy. We had to project the population below from Cape Kennedy to Africa. So it got into a very, a lot of high level math. And uh, <clears throat> later on, I realized the Lord has used my math background to, uh, to the point where I see things very black and white. Everything is either true or false and either right or wrong. And so, I don't know. I think that's kind of a good attitude um, to have as an apologist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> yeah, but the, it's a double-edged sword. Um, in, mm -hmm. in theology, gosh, 80% of things are gray areas and they are oh, yeah. They're not black and white. I mean, some things are black and white, absolutely. Uh, but some, some things are not that clear cut and, and they do have a lot of distinctions involved. And yeah. this kind of simplistic understanding of the faith kind of explains why he has such a simplistic understanding of these oh, issues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know the the go to case that I always like to reference is Thomism versus Molinism. Like, you know, which one's the correct one? And you know, for me, it's just like, I don't know. like the, the the church allows both. Mm -hmm. And you know, like somebody could probably convince me of either one, and I'm open to being convinced of either one. But like to mm -hmm. me, it's just like, okay, whatever. So that whole black and white attitude, like you said there, like it doesn't. It, it, it can be good in sometimes like for instance like whenever it comes to something that's very clearly evil like you know sodomy yeah. or something like that sure. okay that's very black and white we're not going to sure. compromise with that that's good sure but like you said in that 80 percent of gray area like that's you need to you yeah. need to develop it a little bit more which explains why he has such a simplistic understanding of justification that yeah. this, it, it all makes sense now yeah so okay my education as a math major really helped me out on that end. But um, after serving at Cape Kennedy for a while, Ross Perot recruited me to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so, again, I was very devout as a Roman Catholic. In fact, I was responsible for bringing the very first Little Rock Scripture study to a Dallas Catholic church. And so it was at that time that I began. Do you have any idea what that is? I've never heard yeah, of that. Um, yeah. So in, um, in Little Rock, Arkansas, there is an uh, abbey there. And I think they started some Bible studies. And in fact, they have the Little Rock Study Bible. I have it somewhere here in my office uh, that they produced that kind of came out of their Bible studies. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess the fact that he knew what that was makes me... Okay, so I, earlier I was like questioning like if he was Catholic. If you're going to know that a little bit of obscure detail, I feel like that's like, okay. That throws all doubt away. He was actually at one time Catholic. I mean, I, I think he, I think he was. I just don't yeah. think that he understood the very basics of the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh man. And who we? I thought Ross Perot was cool. Like it's funny because, you know, uh, like I think it was like in one of your openings, like the the original one where it's driving through like the Dallas, uh, like downtown Dallas, whatever. I think like in that, like you drive right past the Ross Perot Museum. Did I? So, yeah, but anyway, funny. Yeah, began opening the Bible. Ah, hold on. Bible for the first time. Hold on. He's opening the Bible for the first time. Can you rewind that? Yeah, hold on. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Ten seconds. Roman Catholic. In fact, I was responsible for bringing the very first Little Rock Scripture study to a Dallas Catholic church, and so it was at that time that I began opening the Bible for the first time. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. 
He was yeah. teaching high school catechetics. <clears throat> And allegedly, by his own by his own admission, he had never opened the Bible before. If we're getting the timeline right, yeah. If if this is chronological and he's not somehow, you know, <laughs> then I, yeah. Um, wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, it's all making sense now. <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. <laughs> I mean, this is why I'm saying he, he was an easy target. Um, yeah. You don't. You know. If if you're just now opening up the Bible for the first time. Yeah. And if you are a Pelagian, you're, you're going to be ripe for the picking for some uh, evangelical missionary to come and approach you and open up the Bible and read a couple scriptures from Romans three and four and, and, and deceive you into embracing their false understanding of yeah. Christianity. You know, I, I think it's so true what St. Jerome said, and I've got this, I've got this like, uh, kind of this this thought kind of like the forefront of my mind, um, forefront of my mind pretty often, and that's you know ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, and yeah. Uh, yeah so like that's why like I, I mentioned it earlier. I'll mention it again. The the Bible in a Year project is something that I think is just like a, a huge thing. So it's just like hey, if y'all haven't gone cover to cover with the Bible yet, and you're a little intimidated, you know Bible in a Year, do it. It you you know you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna do that. Oh, and I've got Braden in here. Saying, you know, man, a former Catholic who didn't open the Bible, therefore Catholicism is wrong. <laughs> I'll, I'll point out that he um, he was he was vulnerable for really any group to come along at that point. A, a Muslim mm. could have came around and, and opened up the Bible and twisted him and, uh, you know, had him really confused. A Mormon could have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he was right for the picking for really any group. Mm, yeah, no, that's a really good point. So anyway, let's, let's see if we can, you can uh, be enlightened a little bit more by uh, Mike. All right, let's, let's, I maybe you, maybe it'll teach us something. Yeah. yeah. On our coffee table. But all it did was collect dust for 34 years because oh. the oh. priests were telling me it's too dark. Oh. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wait, see, see, I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt and thought, well, maybe this isn't chronological in nature. You know, maybe he was doing these teachings where you, you mentioned he was teaching a high schooler based on what he said there, the, the high school group. You know, I thought maybe this wasn't chronological, but there goes that. 34 mm -hmm. years, you did not open up the Bible. And I'm going to back it up a little bit, too, because he's, he looks like he's he's winding up to say that it was his priest that told him not to read it. So i that I began opening the Bible for the first time. I had a Catholic Bible that sat on our coffee table. But all it did was collect dust for 34 years because the priests were telling me it's too difficult to understand. Don't even try to read it. So I don't I don't know. I've never personally never met a priest God, that recommended um, me. That doesn't yeah. sound like a post conciliar priest. <laughs> because not that necessarily the pre conciliar ones were that way, but what I'm saying is, um, yeah, is isn't it very clearly the case according to Vatican II? Uh, that we should be reading sacred scripture and it's profitable for us. And you know, yeah. we have that whole document day verbal that's dedicated to this uh, among other documents with Vatican II. Um, and, and, and even in, even in the preconciliar era, look at um, Leo the 13th. What was it? Providentissimus Deus mm -hmm. as a whole encyclical encouraging uh, study of the scriptures. And so I think Divine Aflante Spiritu was another one. Um by a later pope so i mean there there has been plenty of encouragement on part of the popes and the magisterium to read scripture so i don't know if if this priest actually said that it sounds like this was a priest who wasn't familiar with the magisterial documents in yeah oh, I, I wanted to point this out I was like so i didn't read the bible therefore catholicism is false this should be a meme <laughs> agreed but again, it's understandable now why he was such an easy target. But your question still remains. How could he still be this ignorant this many years later? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tom saying, you know, I'm 63 years old and I've never heard a single priest ever in my life tell us don't read the Bible. Yeah, I've, which, I've never heard that either. Yeah, that that's that's one of those things. And I think Tom, like, especially gives like a very uh, unique experience because it looks like Tom and Mike are about the same age. So it's just like, well, you know, maybe it was the 90s and things were a little crazy. You know, it's like, nope, nope, forget it. Um, 
because that's not the case here. Even if, even if for some odd reason you didn't read the Bible on your own, which you should be doing, and there's even indulgences for doing, but even if for some odd reason you've chosen to not read Scripture, which again is a ridiculous thing, um, if you were just going to weekly Mass, you, you hear Scripture constantly there. So if you were just paying attention, you would have heard the vast majority of the canon of sacred scripture in three mm -hmm. a three year period if you're going to a Latin Rite parish. So I I don't understand like even if he never opened his Bible, how is he not paying attention to the liturgical readings at Mass? Yeah, and like also because of his age, like there's not e there's not even the excuse of like oh well it was being read in Latin. Like mm, no, by the time that. He reached the age of reason. It would have all been in English at that time. So there's other than like, I just wasn't paying attention. That's really the only thing that you could say. But even then, like whether it's deception or just ignorance, like both of these are like, both of these reasons are like good enough to like not listen to this guy. Yeah. But even in, even in some of the Latin masses, they'll read it in Latin and then they'll read an English translation of, yeah. of the reading. And so yeah. I, there, there's absolutely no excuse here. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's see let's see uh, what other knowledge bomb he's going to drop on us. Let's do it. So I just let it sit there, and I saw an ad in the Dallas Fort Worth paper, Dallas Morning News. It said, <clears throat> "Speaker to do a seminar on evidence for the Christian faith." And I thought to myself, "Evidence? You mean there's evidence for what I believe?" Because if you'd asked me why I believe my Catholic faith, I'd have said because the priest told me to believe it, and so I really didn't have that evidence. So I went to this three-day seminar, and during that three days, the speaker convinced me that the Bible needed to become my supreme authority on all matters of faith. And so I began. Wait, so you went from evidence of Christianity is true to sola scriptura, maybe even solo scriptura at this point. So I, what? I'm fine with us saying that scripture is, the, uh, is to be given priority and is supreme in that sense. Um, because everything that is dogmatic in nature is is there in scripture. And so I don't I don't have a problem with us putting scripture in the forefront and going to it. Okay. The, the problem is they're they're doing more than that. They're not simply going to scripture. First of all, they're they're going to a truncated version of the canon. But even if we're just going to deal with the protocanonicals, that's fine. They're they're still putting their spin on it. Right. They're still putting mm -hmm. a spin in their interpretation on scripture when they read it, which is not historical in nature. Um, it, it would be it would be kind of like where Jesus talks about it would be better to cut off your you know, arm than to go into hell, you know, um, with both limbs. Uh, it, it would be just better to cut off, you know, a, a, a limb if you have to, to avoid sin. Mm -hmm. It would be like me just opening up my Bible and saying, I, I literally, based on that, I literally have to go and, you know, cut off my arm or something like that. And people would say, well, that's absurd. That's just simply not the historical context. People have historically understood this is hyperbole. But if you're just going to divorce scripture from its historical interpretation, yeah, upon what basis could you tell the person that they're wrong to come away with that interpretation? So, in in other words, the point is this: they're coming and they're approaching scripture with a way of interpreting it that is completely divorced from how it was historically understood, and so because of that, they're coming to some false conclusions about what scripture says. So again, I don't have a problem with going to scripture. My problem is when we go there, how do we interpret it? That's where we're going to find differences. I'm going to say, as part of biblical exegesis, you have to consider the uh, historical context behind it. And not only behind just the words itself, but also how was this understood by the Christian community historically? Since the Holy Spirit is, is still operative and has been operative in his church for 2,000 years. So how was this understood by Christians historically? Yeah, yeah. Man, and you know, you, you've kind of already touched on it as well. So this guy had such a shallow, shallow view of the faith. So like he was really just ripe for the picking. So if anybody just suggested anything to him, like, um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let's, uh, let's see what we've got. Let's see what we've got uh, coming up next.
and reading it for the first time. And as I read it, I remember reading so many things that were contrary to what I was taught as a Catholic. And you know, I look back on my Catholic life now, and I think there was what John MacArthur today calls a safety net, which is purgatory. I knew that I wasn't. Hmm. Stop right there. Purgatory is not a safety net. Hmm. Like, um, and also John MacArthur is a, in a horrible resource for, yeah. <laughs> for understanding and engaging Catholicism. Gosh, I remember when I was a Protestant, I used to listen to John MacArthur and a few others and, yeah, he doesn't know very much, so not a very good resource. But yeah, you're you're right to point out it's it's not a safety net, and if you're treating treating it as a safety net, you have a fundamental understanding of salvation and God's grace, yeah. um, in the work of redemption in your life. And so mm -hmm. again, it's it's no wonder he was just such an easy easy target. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I'm good enough to get to heaven, but I always hope that. When I died, I could go to purgatory because the Catholic Church taught that all sins are not mortal, that there are venial sins. And look. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that prima facie, that's a true statement. But like that also stands to reason as well. Like it stealing a stamp is not near as bad as murdering your mother. I mean, somebody you'd be hard pressed to convince me otherwise. But like that, that, that sounds about right to, to you too. Right, Mike? As as far as the distinction between venial and mortal sins? Yeah. Like if I stole a stamp from you versus like I murdered my own mother, like one of those is like clearly more wrong and would yeah. probably like warrant a worse punishment, right? Yeah, well, one's not even really grave matter, you you could argue, <laughs> but it certainly it doesn't have the other two requirements um in, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, full knowledge and full consent, but but I guess all right. If you stole a penny from me and you had full knowledge and full consent, it, it's still not grave matter because again, stealing a penny is not in and of itself uh, gravely defrauding me. Now, if if somehow that penny was necessary for me to survive, well, and you okay. stole the penny. Now that would be grave matter. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now we're going out <laughs> the parking lot. Yeah, like, it depends on the the context here, but sure, yeah, yeah. On a whole, what you're saying is accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see what he's got. Uh, where he's going with this here? Looking at my life, um, I wasn't murdering anybody, which was a mortal sin, and I wasn't missing church on Sunday, which was a mortal sin. And so I rationalized that the things I was doing were all venial sins, and it didn't cause death or time in hell. It just meant I would have to spend some time in he, purgatory, purging away my. He rationalized everything else was an immortal sin. So I guess he wasn't engaged in any kind of sexual sins or, I mean, there's a million other sins that you could name that involve grave matter and could be mortal in nature that don't involve murder and don't involve you, um, you know, <laughs> uh, not going to church on Sunday. And so, from that, he rationalized that he didn't have any mortal sins. It was all venial. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's... So I guess, you know, I... <laughs> maybe he wasn't giving us an exhaustive list of, of mortal sins there. Maybe it was just a rhetorical point and he wasn't giving us an exhaustive list. So I'll, I'll just try to be charitable and say, okay, maybe that was. Some... You know what? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe he was innocent enough that, um, you know, but maybe, he was, maybe he was. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, let's see what we got next. My venial sins. And so looking back as a Catholic, I was deceived. And Costi, the nature of deception is that people do not know they're deceived until they're confronted with the truth. And here mm. I was. Mm. Mm. Tell Weird. me about that, Mike. Yeah, tell me yeah. about that. <laughs> tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> and now that you've been confronted with the truth for years now, uh, yeah, what, tell, tell me more about deception. <laughs> <laughs> opening the Bible for the first time at age 34, and I was seeing the truth of God's word. And I was realizing, okay, I've been deceived about venial sins and mortal sins. I was deceived about doing works that would qualify me for heaven. I remember reading Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of work. I think my uh, Michael Lofton down below here is, is having, uh, I, I don't know if he... It sounds like you're also hearing this for the first time and you're about to apostatize. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All all Ephesians to eight through nine and, and just for good measure, eight eight through ten really. Mm -hmm. um, all that really does is tell you that salvation is not Pelagian in nature. 
nature. That that's all it does. It doesn't it doesn't touch on the question of the nature of justification and the differences between Catholics and Protestants. It doesn't engage that. Both Catholics and Protestants are in lockstep agreement with Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Um, the difference is, is a little bit more specific than that whenever we're speaking of the, the differences in justification. So, yeah, anytime I hear Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, and, and also, again, verse 10 for good measure, um, I, I'm, just, I'm just blown away. Because again, it tells me the person who is bringing this up, the, I'll, I'll, I'll prove a point. Any Protestant who uses this against Catholicism, ask them, please define the difference between Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism versus what the Council of Trent presented. See if they can define what Trent presented, what semi-Pelagianism is, and what Pelagianism is. If they can't tell you the distinctions between those things, they don't know what they're doing. They don't belong in the discussion. They're abusing Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah. And they're doing so because they learned this as a tradition from men, a tradition that once again makes void the word of God, which is curious because that's what they accuse us of doing. Boom. Mic drop. No pun intended. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's keep going so that no man may boast and my uncle was a catholic priest and i remember what <laughs> oh god bless him god bless I, him. you know i would be curious to like if, if his uncle's still alive to like reach out to him is like hey father would you be willing to talk to us a little bit about your nephew but i, I wonder what the family reunions are like. That's what I'm wondering right now. Yeah. Goodness. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, let, let's let's uh, take a moment to all, all of us tonight, you know, pray uh pray for pray for uh Mike Gendron's uh uncle the priest uh because if he's still around then he could use the grace and uh if uh if he's no longer with us then like he could definitely you know, use the prayers on that side of eternity. So anyway, Let's keep going. After I read that, I called him up and I said, Father Charles, why does the Bible teach something different from what the Catholic Church taught me? And he said, well, it doesn't. We agree with the Bible. And I said, well, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and I read him the verse and he said, Mike, God doesn't really mean what he's saying there. What? What? That's a stupid response. That might be a stupid response from, for, from an otherwise smart man, but that's a dumb response. So... It's hard for me to believe that somebody would actually say that. You know, it's like I, it's like the Protestant the other day he, that I was critiquing on one of my videos. He claimed that some some uh, Catholic that he was talking to said that the Bible's full of errors. I'm thinking, what Catholic would say that unless it's just somebody who's so ignorant they don't. They're right. maybe a, maybe they're a Mike Mike Gendron in the making. Unless yeah. they're a Mike Gendron in the making. Um, I don't know how a Catholic could possibly say such a thing. And yeah. and I kind of wonder the same thing here. Like, really? I don't know. Maybe there is a Catholic priest out there who would say something like that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, but, you know. but here's the point. Okay, let's say you do have a Catholic priest who said something that's stupid. All right. Then you just have a Catholic priest who says stupid things. That yeah. doesn't refute Catholicism. Now, I can point to all kinds of Protestants who say stupid things. I can point to probably people who follow Mike Gendron, who mm -hmm. would say something stupid like the KJV is the kind of Bible that, you know, Paul used or something like that. <laughs> if it's good enough you for know, Paul, it's good enough for me. Yeah, you could find a Protestant that would say something stupid like that. And, and they would probably be close associates in some cases with my Gendron. Does that somehow invalidate Protestantism? Does that, does that even nullify everything that Mike would say just because there's an association there? No, neither does it somehow, you know, refute Catholicism just because you have a priest who says stupid things. Um, wow. I here's my thing again. If you're going to critique Catholicism, critique Catholicism based on what we actually teach, not what stupid people say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's one thing that like I've noticed that like there's so 
the difference between like Catholicism and Pastor Jim's Bible Church mm -hmm. is that like if Pastor Jim says something stupid, mm -hmm. that's doctrine for all intents and purposes. They're not going to use that term, but like that is what Pastor Jim's Bible Church believes is that that mm -hmm. dumb thing that Pastor Jim says. If we have Father Jim who says something stupid, well, that just means that Father Jim's wrong, but it has no bearing on doctrine. So, mm -hmm. and I think that, that that might be a fundamental uh, misunderstanding from um, from the from the Catholic Protestant discussion is that like, oh, well, I heard a Catholic say this, so that makes that that's what you guys believe, and it's just like that's not how that works in our circles. You got to actually go to. Uh, uh, yeah, but, uh, but anyway, so Ryan, Ryan, thank you for the correction. It's actually, uh, uh, Pastor Jim's Bible hut. So, because it's installed into a, an old pizza hut. So, but, so anyway, Mike's, Mike's, uh, he's, he's, he's illuminating our minds now. We are so much better off than we were yeah, when I'm, we started. I'm, I'm hearing the gospel for the first time. This is just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's go. And I thought to myself. How does he know what God really meant? It's very clear to me. We're saved by grace apart from works. It's not of myself. It's a gift of God. And so I hung up. It's not of myself. It's a gift of God. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're there. But like, uh, I, I think that's like, we're, we're, we're all on board there. Like his uncle may have been a little confused or, you know, I don't know what the context of this conversation was happening, but like, if it was just like a, if it was like a phone call, like, you know, before a funeral or something like that. And, and his uncle's just telling him whatever he needs to just to get him off the phone of like, Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Just shut up. I'm, I, I gotta go, you know, or something like that. Or if it's just like, he's asking these questions like after immediately after mass and he's surrounded by like 13 little old ladies. Now that's not an excuse, but it's just one of those things of like, is this an actual discussion or is it just uh like, I'm going to tell you what I don't I know. I, I don't care what it is. Let's say it's the priest dissertation. I don't care what it is. It does. It's irrelevant. What this priest told you is absolutely irrelevant to engaging the Catholic Church. You have to go to our actual sources of theology. Number one, our primary source of theology is sacred scripture. You got to go to sacred scripture. Now, in this case, we're dealing with Ephesians 2.8, so we're, al we're already dealing with it. Okay, that's fine. So then we engage the other sources of Catholicism, perhaps... Um, uh, something in the liturgy, perhaps something in the fathers, perhaps something in the magisterium. Show show us in our sources of theology, you, you know, where we're saying something that is false and then refute it. Don't just go to, well, pre so-and-so said this and that. Because yeah. again, it, it would he would not consider it fair if I just walked up to some random guy over here in in monroe louisiana some random guy who um identifies as a non-denominational christian and asked him a question about salvation and when he gives me a stupid response i say see that's why i'm not protestant yeah that, yeah that and wouldn't would, be at that wouldn't be adequate to <laughs> to to sufficiently engage protestants he he would be right to call tell to tell you that like that's poor reasoning that's that's a bad Correct. argument yeah. Correct. You would need to go to their sources of theology, which would be, of course, sacred scripture. And then if it's a confessional Protestant, you could go to their confessions. Now, in his case, I think he's non-denominational and they don't have confessions. <laughs> and he's a solo scripturist. So you would just have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him on scripture, which would not be hard to do in the case of Mike. <laughs> well, we've got Pastor Mike's Bible Church here. So, yeah, there we go. All right. Let's, let's see what else he's got for us. Yeah, but I continued reading the Bible. And the more I read, the more I had a crisis of faith. I would read Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because oh, of Oh, oh, I love that. I love Titus 3, 5, that he brings that up. That is so fascinating. You want to actually uh, pull it up together? Okay, yeah, let's see here he if I can. Uh... I'm so happy he brought up Titus 3, 5. I was excited to hear as soon as I Titus read Titus 3, 5. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go to it. Let's, let me pull up my verb on here. Okay. Here. Yeah. Just share it, and I'll I'll pull it up on the screen. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Here. The computer's taking a second. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. While you're doing that, I'll address uh, Father John Brown's uh, comment. He said, uh, "The." Uh, it's like we well, were prompted. It's like Father John. We always 
all of us act a little better when you're in the chat. So anyway, all right, go ahead. <laughs> now you'll notice he quoted the first part, right? He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And he stopped there. But notice the rest of the verse. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's a curious phrase. Washing of regeneration. So if you look at the terms that are being used here, um, it's hearkening back to the washings of the priests in the tabernacle and slash the temple in the Old Testament. It's actually a physical washing, a ritual washing that they underwent. And notice it's connecting the phenomenon or the event of regeneration by the Holy Spirit with actual washing. What does that mean? That's called baptismal regeneration. It's referring to regeneration coming about through baptism, um, which is, again, how Christians have historically interpreted this passage. And that's, of course, consistent with Acts chapter 2, 38 through 39 as well, where, where Peter tells uh, the people that he's speaking to there to repent of their sins and be baptized for, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and he tells them for the remission of their sins. So, Again, it's just so curious. He brings that up, but then this is one of the major proof texts for baptismal regeneration. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, again, I don't have a problem with that. He saved us. First of all, we can ask what aspect of salvation, because he would recognize there's a distinction between initial justification, sanctification, glorification. You know, salvation can be both past present and future in scripture so what what form of salvation are we talking about we could ask that question but he saved us not because of works done in us by righteousness absolutely we're not pelagians we do not believe that somehow i'm producing a work that makes god now a debtor to me and now god owes me salvation because I've worked for it. No, Paul condemns that in Romans 4. And he shows that salvation isn't some kind of wage that now God is somehow a debtor to me and owes me as maybe um, a boss owes me wage when I work for him. No. So, mm -hmm. of course, it's not by works done us done by us in righteousness. Of course, it's not. It's by grace. But then notice that. <laughs> the washing of regeneration. You got to love it. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Pastor Mike, uh, for for accidentally referencing a, a verse that disproves your position. He, he just put it on the tee for us right there to just swing. There you go. So, all right. <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> then I read that um, God promises eternal life. You see, as a Roman Catholic, I only had conditional life. Jesus only opened. Huh? What, what is that supposed to mean? Like eternal? So, so yeah. I'll, I'll point out that even here, he, he is going to be at odds with other Protestants. It sounds like he believes the once saved, always saved version of, mm, yes. of Protestantism. And again, he's going to be at odds with quite a few Protestants who don't believe that. And so what he's calling conditional salvation. That is that I'm presuming that you could somehow lose your salvation. This isn't a Catholic versus Protestant thing. This is a Mike Gindron's version of Protestantism versus other people's version of Protestantism thing. That's what this mm. is. Yeah. And so I suppose it's one of those things that like if you were uh, just just to give an example of a bad argument, like you wouldn't be able to use this, the things that were like disproving gendron now you wouldn't be able to use that against somebody like dr jordan cooper or something like that like right yeah. which you know dr jordan cooper as a lutheran would also agree um with catholics on baptismal regeneration that's another right there. but but um but yeah um you know I, I i'm pretty sure he wouldn't maintain once saved always saved i'm pretty yeah. i'm pretty sure but but even if i'm wrong i mean there's plenty of other protestants who would not affirm one saved always saved so this isn't a again catholic versus protestant thing this yeah. is a debate that takes place even among protestants <laughs> this is even a protestant versus protestant issue so it is <laughs> yeah let's go in the gates of heaven according to the catholic church i had to do my part to get through the gates of heaven and so when i read first john 5 13 
where John writes to those who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. I thought, wow, we can know that we have eternal life. And so that. Okay. So here's a, here's a point. Um, let's say a person um, repents of their sins. You know, there there's some pagan. They repent of their sins and they're baptized and they immediately die. Did they have any merit? No, they didn't have any merit. Uh, do they go to heaven? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't that completely then invalidate his understanding and portrayal then of Catholicism? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a, a Catholic can affirm that a person can have absolutely no merit and still go to heaven. The question, however, is this post justification. Uh, what role do, do works play in relation to um, increases in justification? That's where the question really is. And from everything that I've heard with Gendron, that's not even on his radar. He's not even aware that that is a question and that that is a debate. So mm. I, I he operates with a very overly simplistic understanding of these issues. And I, what I'm afraid of is that if if you were to sit Mike down and say, okay, well, please explain to me the distinction between initial justification and increases in justification as understood by Council of Trent, he he would be lost. He wouldn't be able to, he wouldn't tell, he would not know what the Catholic Church teaches there. And that would prove my point that he, he doesn't understand Catholicism well enough to engage it. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah it's frustrating yeah this is what low-hanging fruit does every time it just <laughs> it leaves you frustrated <laughs> yeah so all right well let's see let's see if he can let's see if he can turn it around where it looks like we're about through the first quarter i don't think we're gonna get through this whole thing but uh you know we're through the first quarter maybe he's got he's got three more to turn it around mm -hmm. caused me to read more of john's epistle those first four chapters and it really gives an indication as what a true Christian looks like. And then I read that there was one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I thought to myself, you know, as a Catholic, I'm going through all of these different mediators. I'm going through the priest. I would have to go to him to confess my sins. And I was going through the Catholic Church. So How to Be Christian did a did a premiere today, which is so funny because like uh, he's got this quote unquote uh, rivalry with Trent, which is just hilarious. And like as, as Trent's assistant, I do everything I can to like fan the fame flames of that rivalry though. Like I really appreciate the work that he does, but uh, he, it was, it was on this topic of like the one mediator. And I asked the question of what exactly do these Protestant ministers ministers think that they're doing to their, to their uh, congregations? Do they think that they're merely only blessing them with their own wisdom? I would hope not. I would hope that these ministers would be thinking that they were bringing Christ to these people or, and like vice versa, bringing these people to Christ. However, doesn't that sound a lot like mediation? Right. You're, you're right to point this out. It's something I've brought up a lot. Uh, would they not agree that there is a form of mediation in salvation of souls when they go and preach the gospel? Mm. I mean, doesn't scripture itself note in the New Testament, you know, how, how will they believe if, if somebody is not sent? You know, someone's not sent and they don't hear the message of the gospel. How are they going to believe it? So clearly you have some mediation in salvation, in the salvation Church of a person. And Mary oh. was another sinless mediator. Oh, sorry. You have that mediation lady. because a person is bringing the gospel to somebody else that they didn't previously have. Now, you know, could God save a person without preachers? Of course he could. But he generally wants to use people so that we can participate in the transformation of lives. And so he allows us to participate as mediators in that sense. But nobody's denying that Jesus is the unique and exclusive mediator in the sense that First Timothy is talking about, which is simply that um, Jesus is the unique mediator insofar as he is the only one who is fully God and fully man and can therefore mediate between God and man in, in the atonement. A absolutely. He's fully God, fully man. He represents both sides in the atonement. He is that unique mediator. Nobody's denying that. 
Mary's not a mediator in that sense. None of the saints are mediators in that sense. Jesus is a unique mediator in that sense. But again, are there other forms of mediation? Yes. And that's all we're talking about whenever we might go to some of the saints and ask them to pray for us, or we might go to a priest for absolution in the confession. Right. Those are different forms of mediation. So again, first, first Timothy has absolutely nothing to do with that. But you'll notice this. It's the same scriptures over and over that have been answered a million times. And my my challenge would be if, if I had the opportunity to ever ask him a question, I would ask Gendron, okay, so you bring up First Timothy here as a response to all these things. What do you think the Catholic response is to your argument here? And if he can't articulate the Catholic response, uh, uh, you know, some of the stronger Catholic responses to his argument, if he can't repeat those back, he's not listening. He's not being fair. Like if if um, it's kind of like if you if you go to a drive through and you and you you order your food and they can't repeat your order at all. Well, you clearly know that the person on the other end isn't paying attention. Same thing here. If Mike Gendron can't repeat our order and tell us, well, what is our response to your argument right now? If you don't know it, you're not paying attention and you haven't really given us a fair shake. Yeah. You know, I just want to know, since you've been stealing my turf on the low hanging fruit thing, I'm just going to let you know, I'm going to steal that fast food reference there. <laughs> and I'm going to tell people that I made it up. So, uh, <laughs> and then Go we'll call it, it even. <laughs> <laughs> so, i got it from gary gary smalley i actually adapted gary smalley by the way is a protestant so the irony here um, but i mean it's a good point <laughs> but i mean the thing is if you're going to do apologetics you don't need to just know your side you also need to know what your opponent says in relation to your arguments and then know what your response is to that and then know what their response is to that and then know what your response will be to that you want to you want to think a good five steps ahead. If you're not doing that, you're not a good apologist, and you haven't yeah. really considered the opposition. Yeah. And by the way, if you haven't considered the opposition, you haven't thought through your own position very well. So, mm. in other words, Mike has not thought through what he is saying here. He's vomiting on the microphone nonsense, and he hasn't really thought through what he's saying because he hasn't actually heard. Well, what are my critics saying in response to me? Mm -hmm. on this very point and i honestly from everything i've seen from him i don't think he's paying attention yeah yeah no and I, actually while you're while you're saying this like i'm just thinking of carla brassard's book you know like uh meeting the protestant challenge i think is the first one and then meeting the protestant response mm -hmm. so it's even like you know catholicism challenge response response to the response you know and then the response to that you know and it's just like you know we're like four or five, I've lost count, four or five layers deep into that. And it's just like, but that's, that's necessary because you can't just like build up your straw man, knock it down and go, ha, we win. Yeah. Because again, you haven't even thought through your own position very well. If you haven't listened to the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I guess, uh, you know, we've got a lot of Cajuns in here. This is, I don't, this wasn't, this wasn't my intention, but yeah. Anyway, so let's, let's, let's go. Theater. And so all these things began causing me to have doubt about my Catholic faith and believe me, hold on. They indoctrinated me from the time I could think that the Catholic church was the one true church and that the Catholic church, as long as you're in it, we're going to get you to heaven. I'll be through. So if you're if you're Catholic, that means you're automatically going to heaven. Um, that that does that sound about right? I don't I don't know if I've ever believed that before, but uh, you know the Catholic Church is the one true church. I know a lot of Protestants bristle at that at that claim. Was he indicating that we believe that because outside the church there is no salvation, that all Catholics are going to heaven? Is that what he just said? That seemed to be can, like can you what he was. Can you maybe yeah, here. play it back? Yeah. Catholic faith. And believe me, they indoctrinated me from the time I could think that the Catholic Church was the one true church and that the Catholic Church, as long as you're in it, we're going to get you to heaven. OK, so that doesn't even make sense with his own understanding of Catholicism, because earlier he believed that he had to merit his way into heaven. 
well, if all you have to do is be a Catholic to go to heaven, that doesn't even make sense of his own understanding of Catholicism. So it doesn't even sound consistent with what he's presented so far. How How yeah. is it that you're automatically going to heaven as long as you're Catholic if you also have to earn your way to heaven as a Catholic? That doesn't make sense. Hmm. And and you also mentioned that salvation is conditional uh, from the Catholic perspective. And clearly he wouldn't assert that the only condition is to be a Catholic since he's talking in the context of earning his way to heaven. So it it doesn't even sound like he has a coherent presentation of what the Catholic Church teaches yeah. or what his understanding of Catholicism was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do have to sincerely question, you know, the motives here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, let's, let's 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 see if we can get through a little bit more of this. It's it's so funny. Like we're like an, almost an hour and a half into this. This is how through. it usually is. I mean, I yeah. thought you knew the rule of Lofton. What was it? The oh. rule of Lofton is like for every one minute that I review, I spend 10 minutes reviewing one minute. I think that's the ratio. I think. Okay. But I think we might be that having. Makes, huh? We might but be then, having. Well, look at the time. We've gone 11 minutes into this and we're at, at an hour 20. So wouldn't that be the, so we, the rule of minutes. Lofton? Yeah. Is if that, anything, we're actually running a little ahead of schedule. Okay, but like right. I've tried to, I've tried to do ginger and stuff on my low-hanging fruit stuff before, and like this was back whenever I was like pre-recording them or whatever. It was a one-minute video, and it took me ten minutes to respond to it. Me responding to it, which was just like just everything, because you know we keep having to pause it. Like it's just like stop. I'm not letting that slide. Like we're not letting this one go. We're going. We're going to address this. And like I think that's why he's been able to get away with it for so long is that he has like no uh like all of his videos are so long that like people just don't want to yeah. like slog through it all well think of it like this um yeah in he might do a 2 hour video but to respond to the mess that he makes in 2 hours might require 10 hours think of it like this i could trash the room that i'm in right now i could trash this in less than 2 minutes I could just knock down all of the bookshelves, all the studio equipment, just run through, knock it down probably two minutes. I don't know. Yeah. But it would take a good two days to put it all back together the way it is now. Right? It's yep. easy to make a mess. It's a lot harder to undo it. So it's easy for him to assert all kinds of um, objections to Catholicism in two hours but it might take 10 hours to respond to it all if not 20 hours yeah 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 so i although you know dietrich does bring up it's like all the fake books because yeah, you know, well, we know, you know. It's, it's just a green screen right so, all right you know as opposed to my absolutely real bookshelf behind me <laughs> um, <laughs> by the way i don't know if you saw this but i got a uh with some of the lights behind me i got a yeah where i can now adjust them you see oh man so oh man I, I guess i got a really fancy green screen because i can change the color of the green screen now you know what I, I, you may have gotten yourself a thursday to do all that too so but <laughs> <laughs> no i put it together myself <laughs> nice very cool all right well let's let's see what mike's got for us here i'll be through a detour in purgatory but keep trusting the church okay so purgatory is an absolutely guaranteed like you have to go through it. If you're Catholic, you're going to go to purgatory and to heaven. Okay. All right, cool. Glad to know that that's how well, that works. Again, that's inconsistent with his own presentation of what he believed about Catholicism because he presented it as him having to earn his way to heaven, but he should know very well, all who go to purgatory go to heaven. So um, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. It, it's, it's not consistent. I, I guess it's one of those things that, uh, that you know, as long as you're criticizing the Catholic Church, it's fine. You don't actually have to be logically consistent because well, you know. the thing is, as you probably know, this is good enough for his audience mm. because his audience probably knows absolutely nothing here. So, you know, what he's presenting is probably gonna sound very intelligent and very, you know, coherent and convincing 
to mm-hmm. somebody who doesn't know their left from their right. And that's probably all he needs at the end of the day. He yeah. doesn't go, he doesn't need to go and engage Catholic apologists or Catholic scholars or the magisterial doggies. He doesn't need that. He just needs to convince easy targets. He, he's he's there to convince that guy that's going to be in the congregation going, hey, man, like, hey, man, hey, man. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. I think that was it was on that video that I like invited you to come do this. It was just like, oh, you're doing it. I did a response to this guy, too. Here, you should come to come on my channel. So you responded yeah. to that guy. Uh, Adam Fannin. Yeah. You know, he sent he uh, tagged me back in my response. He tagged oh. me to a, like a two minute video uh, criticizing prayers to the Virgin Mary. And it was substantially no different than what I already responded to in the original video. And in other words, he didn't bother to actually engage my response. Oh, cool. I didn't realize that like he was literate. So I didn't know that he could like actually respond. Well, to who, whoever, you know, runs his account, I presumed that it was him, maybe somebody else. Uh, well, as we've already talked about here, like to adequately respond to something, it's like, you know, a 10% rule of like, you know, if you give a one hour response, it really only takes like a two minute, you know, <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's the, in, it's the inverse of the Lofton rule, right? <laughs> yeah. So, all right, let's see what, what Mike's got for us here. And they also went so far as to say, if you ever leave the Catholic Church, you'll go to hell. And so, I mean, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it's a distinct possibility, but it's not necessarily true. I didn't catch that part. Can you tell me what he? Can you? He play said it that again? if you ever leave the Catholic Church, you are going to hell. Yeah, not absolutely speaking. There, there could be some invincible ignorance uh, on per, a part of a person or other mitigating circumstances. Perhaps they're scandalized by inappropriate behavior of a member of the Catholic Church or something, and it yeah know, mitigates their their leaving the Catholic Church. So, yeah, not necessarily. Um, but if it's with full knowledge and full consent of the will, then sure. But again, in many cases with people who leave the Catholic church, they lack a full knowledge and they lack the full consent. Yeah. Yeah. It's like any other grave sin. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So it's like, it's still, it's still a grave sin, but like, you know, it's a lot more than just that. So I don't want to like fall into the trap of like indifferentism, but it's it's, a great sin, but there's mitigating factors as, as yeah. in Catholicism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I look at my life as a Catholic. I was not only deceived, but I was enslaved. I was enslaved to these doctrines that caused a lot of fear. And then I read in second Timothy chapter two, verses 24 to 26 that. <laughs> so it sounds he's, like he's, he's still enslaved. Theology. He's still enslaved. Yeah. He's enslaved by a false gospel. Now I will say that, you know, for even his version of Protestantism, he's not entirely wrong. I mean, he does have some truth. He has some understanding. I mean, for instance, he would say the salvation is by grace. Sure. So it's not like everything that he says is wrong or every understanding that he has of theology is wrong. Um, But at the end of the day, however, he still does have a false gospel. It is a false message. Um, And and then to that extent, he's still enslaved to that extent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would say, yeah, I, I don't know if anything has really substantially changed in his life. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you had a shallow version of, uh, you had a shallow understanding of Christianity. And, and, you while still, I, and you still have a shallow version of Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it might be the difference between half an inch and a three quarters of an inch now, but like it's still shallow. So, yeah, it's all still right. pretty bad. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's see what else he's getting. We are held captive by the devil to do his will. Huh? We're held captive by the devil to do his will. Well, anybody who's a slave to sin, yeah, their yeah. their master is um going to be Satan. But I, I would still suggest that he, he's still ultimately to one extent doing the will of Satan, insofar as he's adhering to a false understanding of the gospel and teaching heresy. And has also objectively left the Catholic Church. To that extent, he's still doing the work of Satan. Now, yeah. there may be other virtuous parts to his life that are that isn't doing the work of Satan, and that I commend. But in this particular area, he's still a slave to sin, and he's still serving Satan, whether he realizes it or not. In yeah. this context, yeah, that, that, that's it's just like while 
while you know it's unclear if he's actually lying or not like it is clear that he is just repeating falsehoods yeah i'm 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 intrigued by that question like is, is he insincere or is he is this sincere i don't know it's so hard to discern a, per, a person's motives yeah but i just i it's hard to really afford him the benefit of the doubt of ignorance when it's been so long and his primary ministry is engaging Catholicism. Yeah. Like that's his entire yeah. shtick. Yeah. Has, how many years has it been? 30 years that he's been it's doing been, this? I, I, I think I looked into it once and I think he like formally apostatized in like 1994 and like just for, just for, you know, reference, I was born in 1992 so like and i'm 31 years old yeah he's been doing this almost 30 years and so i i don't know if i can continue to afford him the benefit of the doubt concerning um you know or just saying that he's he's simply ignorant yeah it seems like there's at the very least as you mentioned earlier voluntary ignorance or or insincerity yeah yeah and I mean, I feel or like or there there is a third option here, and, and that is just a lack of intelligence, frankly. Yeah, it's I, I just like I mean, I, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't know if that's the case. I, I I don't. I wouldn't necessarily say that's probably the most likely one. I think if I had to guess, what's the most likely reason for this phenomenon of Mike Kendron, I would say it's probably willful ignorance. Mm. Yeah. If I yeah. had to, if I, if I just had to guess. Yeah. It's definitely one of those things that like it, it, you know, we could, we could debate, you know, all day long about which one it would specifically be. But at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't matter which one it falls into yeah, it because does. all of them are reasons to like not listen to it. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, the same damage is done, but, but I do have to say, I am fascinated just with the, how does this happen? You know, like how does a person go through 30 years of engaging the Catholic church and still say these things? I am still fascinated by that question, even though I know ultimately it doesn't matter because the same damage is being done either way. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if he uh, turns it around. And here. then I Makes read John cool. chapter eight, verses 31 to 32, where Jesus said, a true disciple of mine is one who abides in my word. Then they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. And I thought to myself, as I'm reading this truth, I'm becoming more and more liberated. The truth is setting me free from all the indoctrination that I had been grown up with. And so he just traded one understanding of the faith that it sounds like he was saying he was indoctrinated with. He's just trading one form of indoctrination for another. All of this is not stuff that Mike Gendron has come up with. It's stuff that we've been hearing from Protestants before Mike Gendron was born. He is reproducing the same tired arguments that Protestants have been producing for several hundred years now, which, again, it's a tradition of men. It's a form of indoctrination. He has not come to this conclusion on his own. He just learned it from somebody else and is repeating it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, uh, that part in the debate that he did over with uh, Brian Mercier where he... Uh, you know, he basically quoted John Calvin and Brian like called him out on it. And he says like, that's John Calvin. That didn't exist prior to the 16th century. And like Mike, like really bristled about it. He's like, that's not John Calvin. And it's just like, yes, this is literally just, this is just nothing but Calvin. Like, well, so, yeah. yeah, he, in that context was saying that, well, this isn't unique to Calvin. It's orig its origin is scripture, and Calvin just repeated it. So it really doesn't matter because ultimately it's rooted in scripture. And what he doesn't seem to understand is that he's conflating his interpretation of scripture with scripture itself. That's the pro he doesn't see that what he's doing is when he approaches the Bible and reads it, there's a pair of glasses on. They're the Mike Gendron glasses that he's <laughs> reading the Bible through. And it's like he doesn't know that he's reading through that pair of glasses. He thinks that he's reading it directly when in reality there is that mediation taking place. And that is his particular spin and interpretation. Um, so, yeah, I agree with what Brian was saying there. He was right to point it out. Yeah. But Mike doesn't understand that he's 
Mike just thinks that he's just going straight to the Bible. I'm right. just going right back to the Bible. You know, you'll, <laughs> I, there's this guy locally, I'm not going to name his name, but he, he's just like that. I'm just going straight to the Bible. It tells you you have to keep the Sabbath. And he's right now like really big into keeping the Sabbath because the Bible says you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. And in his mind, his particular understanding of observing the Sabbath, it's not his understanding. It's not his interpretation. It is the Bible. Gosh darn it. It is the Bible. Again, he doesn't see that, well, there's a distinction between the Bible as it actually is and what it actually means versus your interpretation of the Bible. They, they don't seem to have, they don't seem to be aware of that distinction. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're talking about that. So growing up in southeastern Oklahoma, it's just like, I think I grew up like near like at least five of those guys. So, <laughs> so. it's kind of I mean, it's it's sad because people are in air, but it's a little entertaining to watch. But then at the same time, it's like, yeah, I remember when I was that naive, too. And yeah, I, yeah. I conflate, and I conflated my interpretation with scripture itself. I remember when I was like that. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, that there, but by the grace of God, go go us, right? Or go well, we. I, I've I've been there, so. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. So, all right, let's see, let's see what else he's got. I just really absorbed myself into God's word. I was reading it every day, and and I was continuing to have this crisis of faith. So many things I was reading in the Bible. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins will surely die. I realized I was on death row. I realized that I was headed to hell. And then I read about the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And I can tell you, Costi, as a Catholic, I never heard that. I knew. Interesting. I, so I he I'm... never has been to mass. <laughs> it's like it's all over the liturgy. What in the world are you talking about? It, yeah. It, and, you know, I, I know that, like, he denies the doctrine of original sin. And so he just mentioned there, like, the wages of sin is, is death. And I would just I would be curious to see, like, where his take on, like, why some infants die. You know, like if they've never if they've never sinned, but yet they still die. Well, how is that just? I, oh. I I still can't get past like how do you go to mass and not understand at least a very basic concept of substitutionary atonement? I, yeah, I, I, I still can't figure that out. Uh, it would make sense if he's never been to mass, maybe, or if when he was at mass, he never paid attention. Maybe if you were at mass and you never paid attention, but the problem there is not mass. The problem is you and you not paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> Again, this is just fascinating to me. Like, how does anybody get through the liturgy and come away with this kind of ignorance? I'm, I'm just fascinated I, by it. I, just, I never paid attention. That means what they were trying to teach me was wrong. Right. I just, okay. This, this right. is fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, Let's let's go. That Jesus died for the sins of the world. The Catholic Church proclaimed that every Sunday. But when I found out he died for me, that was salvation. Okay. Well, yay. He says the Catholic Church proclaimed that every Sunday. Excuse me, sir, but it, it proclaims that it that Jesus died specifically for you every Sunday, too. So what what in the world is he talking about? He's saying, Well, yeah, okay, the substitution part is there. It's just not applied to me as an individual. What in the world? Again, that doesn't that doesn't make sense either. It's very clearly applicable and being applied to every individual. I in I want to share I want to share a little bit of a story from whenever I was in basic training. So while we were uh you know waiting for some medical thing whatever they gave us our folders and they said if there's any information that's missing from your folder go ahead and add it there so that way we have it. And like, I noticed that my, my name had like the last two letters missing. Cause I've got a really long last name. So I raised my hand and I said, should I add this missing information? And instead of answering my question, he just looked at the rest of the crowd. He's like, raise your hand. If you think that the information he asked for falls under the category of any information that's missing <laughs> and like everybody raised their hand and it was just like, okay, that was a dumb question. So mine kind of goes there too. It's just like Christ died for the whole world. I'm like, do you think that you don't fall under the category of the whole world? Like, do you live on the moon or which even then that, that would, you know, 
if, if people let, lived on the moon, Christ died let, for them too. But yeah. Let me just give you one of a million parts from the Novus Ordo. I presume <laughs> that's where he went. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word in my soul shall be healed. Not the world soul. Not yeah. A general soul. My soul. It's clearly personal. It's clearly think, being applied to the individual. That would have been pre-2011, so it would have been, uh, and, and I will be healed, or I shall be healed, I, I think. But, but yeah, yeah but same, exactly. the same thing, but the same meaning. So, yeah. I mean, even if you had a variant of that prior to 2011, it's still the same meaning. I will right. be healed. And so, and that's just one example. There's a, numerous others. So, I, I just, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm just really dumbfounded here. Yep. Yep. But I am every time that I listen to Mike. <laughs> every single oh, man. time. I just I could so confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if he, let's see if he can turn it around. And my favorite verse then and even today is Second Corinthians five twenty one, where we read Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Costly, I look at that as the greatest exchange in human history. But Okay, so now, 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 you might be a little bit more familiar than I am with that just right off the cuff. Do you want to just like give us like the Catholic understanding a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we would point out that there there is a translational variant there. Okay, um, and we would note that he didn't become sin, as in like he actually became a sinner, but the variant in uh, translation there is. He became a sin offering, mm. um, which is, again, just su substit simple substitutionary atonement, the righteous mm. for the unrighteous. Um, we affirm that. I mean, we, we profess in the creed the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. But right prior to that, we say, again, the forgiveness of sins. Upon what basis is the forgiveness of sins? I mean, well, obviously, it's in the death of Christ, which we just spoke about even prior to that in the creed that we're reciting he was crucified died and was buried so it's it's also there in the nicene creed as well as just again scattered all throughout the liturgy um so again there there's no problem here with second corinthians we believe that and it's abundantly clear in in the mass if one just simply i guess pays attention mm-hmm but yeah, I, I would point that out. Uh, he became a sin offering for us. He who knew no sin became a sin offering. Yeah. And um, there again, that's not incompatible with Catholicism. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of those things of like, if as a Catholic, you come across a verse that you think like, huh, that contradicts my understanding. I think that's more of a like an invitation to go deeper or like maybe you have, maybe you're a material heretic. Maybe you need to figure that one out. Maybe you need to fix that. And not just like, oh, I need to run to the nearest Baptist church. Like, yeah. But it's just, again, a Catholic can wholeheartedly affirm Second Corinthians, again, as we can affirm everything in Scripture. Sure. So this isn't a point of differentiation between us, e even un unless he's trying to put a particular interpretation on it um, that you might find with some people in the Reformed tradition who would say that God the Father damned his son. You'll hear R.C. Sproul mm. say that. Um, unless he's trying to put that kind of interpretation and spin on 2 Corinthians, then there's no difference here even in interpretation. Mm. It's, it's a non-point. It, it's, it's, there's no difference here. We're not debating this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just a case of like he had no idea what the church actually taught. Yeah. So like. It's so when he finally heard what scripture says it, again, but this is why I said he's an easy target. Exactly. He doesn't have any, he doesn't have any frame of reference or at least not an authentic one to compare what he's reading in scripture with what Catholicism actually is. He He's simply comparing how he understood Catholicism with what he's reading in scripture. And in that case, yeah, you're going to find all kinds of contradictions because you are a Pelagian. So, yeah, you're going to find all kinds of issues when you open up sacred scripture and you're confronted with what it says. But that's not a problem with Catholicism. It's a problem with you.
<laughs> it's a problem with gendernism. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Let's see what else, what other nugget he's got for us. My faith, Christ took all of my sin, all of my guilt, all of my punishment. And what did he give me in return? His perfect righteousness. And even though I was trying to be as good as I possibly could be, I found out that the only way into heaven is perfect righteousness. And so, of course, you and I, we know. This is, of course, going to be bringing in a particular understanding of imputation um, that that is foreign to Christianity historically. Um, we could speak of an imputation, kind of generally speaking, but he's going to see this imputation of Christ's righteousness um, as as everything, and it it doesn't really transform you as an individual. It's simply that when God looks at you, He sees Jesus, and hmm. you're you're still you're still that you know you're still a hill of dung, uh, but uh, you've been covered over by snow. You know, some some would put it that way, a dung hill covered by snow. So when God sees you, he sees the snow, even though in reality you're the dunghill underneath the snow. But God sees you as snow because God's looking at you through the, um, through the work of Jesus. But you considered in and of yourself, you still haven't changed. You're still this nasty, disgusting sinner. Um, whereas we would say the imputation uh, that we receive is also transformative. It does actually make us good and righteous. You don't remain this nasty, disgusting, dunghill sinner. No, God's grace is also transformative. Um, and so that would be more, you know, analogous to what they would, some of them would call sanctification. Um, but yeah, here's where he's starting to, you know, kind of bring in a particular understanding of imputation that's foreign to sacred scripture. And he's reading that, trying to read that into second Corinthians five. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's here. Let's just take a bet. Like, I think that we're going to have to pause again before we hit that <laughs> three thirty six mark. Thirteen thirty six. Right, let's see. Let's see, let's see right. what we got. We'll never be perfect, but God took care of that for us. He gives the righteousness of Christ as a gift to all those who trust in him. So Christ took my sin. He gave me his righteousness. I no longer have to fear hell. I now have a passport into heaven because of his righteousness. And and so as I was reading, all I'm not sure if he's saying that's the good view or the bad view. He's saying that that is his view, which he's saying is the good view. Oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. And okay. there's a general sense in which what he's saying is true, but how that works with justification, how it, you know, you know what actually takes place with the sinner, those are different questions. You know, are, are we actually transformed or do we always just remain this nasty, disgusting dunghill that's offensive to God, but he's not offended because he sees Jesus in us? Mm. Um, or does he actually transform us because of the work of Christ, because of what he's done? Does he actually transform us and make us good and holy and righteous? The problem is for Helm is going to be um, when you start looking at the Old Testament saints, they're described as righteous and blameless. And I would simply ask, how is that the case in light of this understanding of justification? Um, if we in the new covenant are still these nasty, disgusting sinners who are still this, you know, dunghill, we're offensive in God's eyes, but the only reason why he's not offended is because he sees Jesus. Well, if we're that in the new covenant, how can God speak of those in the old covenant who are, even, again, not even in the same covenant um, in the work of grace to the extent that you have in the new covenant it hasn't yet been uh, done yet in the old covenant. How could they be described as righteous? Yeah. Yeah. It's a sincere question. I mean, how, how could they be called righteous and blameless in all their ways? Yeah. Dietrich is ask, asking, uh, you know, where can you get one of those passports? Are they gold? I think they're roughly the same price as a plenary indulgence. Um, so, you know, if you pass, want to I got the passport to heaven. I mean, yeah. I, again, there's a lot of Protestants who are not going to agree with him on that because they're going to say, um, well, you could lose that passport, right? <laughs> right. There's a lot of Protestants who are going to argue that. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so I was wrong too. We made it to thirteen forty-seven. So mm-hmm. I forgot that I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding it. So it, it it was roundabout. Yeah. Anyway, let's Thank see you. here. All of these verses, it really came down to, and, and Kasi, I can't tell you the exact day, even the exact week or month. But the more I was reading, the more I was being set free, and and now I read that. The natural man cannot discern the things of God because they're spiritually appraised. Well, looking back, I started appraising these things. God was revealing the truth and giving me the, the mind to see and to, to believe and to understand. And so there was a time. Okay, so he's just assuming that now that his mind is changing, that he's now got the right view. Yeah, I, and though I affirm the scripture he just quoted, yeah. I don't affirm his interpretation because yeah. I, would, I would more liken what he's saying here to Gnosticism. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of this appeal to, I have this esoteric understanding of the faith and you don't have that. Um, and I, I would just simply say that that's pretty much what the Gnostics were claiming to. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you really distinguish that from them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's generally true that you you do need grace. And so you're, you're going to need the Holy spirit to understand spiritual things. You need that grace. Um, the thing, however, is that God provides that kind of prevenient grace for all. Uh, so that opportunity of understanding the spiritual things are available for all. Yeah. 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 So let's see here if we can uh, get uh, another nugget here. Time where God granted me repentance and he gave me the gift of faith and my life has never been the same. He literally turned my life upside down. And, you know, that word repent is very interesting because in the Catholic Church, They've taken the word repent and they they transliterated into penance. And so Catholics stop. are trying to repent. Stop. Just stop it. Stop. <laughs> He's just repeating the same arguments that he has learned from others. Again, nothing is unique to Mike Gendron. No, none of this is unique to him. He didn't discover any of this. He's just repeating the same traditions of men. Gosh, how many times has this one been buried to conflate the, you know, to to say that, okay, well, what really happened is Catholics had a misunderstanding of the uh, Greek word for repentance, and they replaced it with penance and the Vulgate and the Latin translation. And so they didn't understand what repentance actually meant. And so that then brought about the indulgence system and all this and that. It just stopped. Make it stop, please. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's it's just one of those things. So I, I just pulled it up on etymology.com, which or etym etym etymoline, whatever, um, which is a fantastic resource for anybody going on there. But it's uh yeah, repent is like okay, the uh it's the prefix of it's the intensive prefix of re, so very much, and uh the vulgar Latin of penitere, which is just to regret. So like very much regret that's repentance, but like, it's still that penitence is that it's in there. It's part of the root word. So to say that like, Oh, you changed the word. It's just like, well, well, well they're going to say that metanoia means like to turn the other way and penance would involve other things than merely returning the other way. But I would just oh, okay. simply point out that, well, when you go to confession and you're assigned a penance, what's one of the requisites repentance. Turning I mean, away from sin. Yeah, right. that's one of the requisites. And so <laughs> the, this yeah. is just a non-issue. It's it's a silly argument. We never lost the concept of repentance and somehow replaced it with the concept of penance and then doing penance. Mm-hmm. Because in order to do penance, you also have to repent. You also have to turn away from your sin. You can't do penance while continuing to willfully live in sin. The that's just not penance. So one of the requisite conditions of doing penance is going to be turning away from sin. We never lost that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the language argument here is, is just silly. Yeah, no. And I've heard some, and he, I've heard other silly arguments for whenever, uh, people doing that. Like, I don't know. And this isn't he Mike's, I to my knowledge, Mike's never made this argument, but, um, the, I don't know. Nah, nah, never mind. That's a, no, a non sequitur. This video is already long enough. Let's keep going. Penance in order to have their sins forgiven and to be absolved of their sin. And so this penance is um, it's like a punishment. It's repetitious prayers. You go to the confessional. What? Okay. <sighs> wow. Like the, the repetitious prayers. 
Yeah, it's based on a misunderstanding of what Jesus talks about when he speaks of vain repetitions as the pagans pray, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'm on board I'll, with vain repetitions not happening, but, you know. I'll point out in the book of Revelation that the angels say back and forth to one another over and over and over, holy, holy, holy. Um, so they're they're saying the same prayer over and over and over night and day according to the book of Revelation. You have Jesus who said the same prayer um, multiple times in the garden on the night in which he was betrayed. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, again, as a faithful Jew uh, at the time, they would have prayed what we would consider the liturgy of the hours, which was based on the Psalms. And so they would have prayed the same Psalms over and over and over. Um, <clears throat> so you have plenty of instances in scripture where um, Jesus and others are praying the same things over and over. That's not the same thing as vain repetition. Vain repetition would be you think that somehow because of the number of prayers that you have, God will somehow hear you. And that is not the Catholic position. Mm. We do not believe that just because I've said so many prayers, God is now obligated to answer them in the affirmative or do this or that for me because I've done so many prayers. No, he's not obligated to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> actually, I'm going to I'm going to steal that that note about the angels uh, singing, you know, holy, 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 because and like one of my favorite responses to that is just like, oh, repetitious prayer is bad. Well, you better let the angels know. Uh, they, I don't think they got the memo, uh, so you better you better let them know so that way they can stop. So let me read it to you, Revelation four eight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll pull it up on my screen. Okay, so yeah, just go ahead and share it. Kind of see. Ben Handelman is uh is challenging us to make this four hours long. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, day and night, they never cease to say, day and night, they never cease to say, <laughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Day and night, they never cease to say. Boom. They're saying it over and over and over and over and over. Um, again, is that vain repetition as the pagans do? Is that somehow sinful? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if, if you're I guess, this, I guess the seraphim are in sin now. <laughs> I guess yeah. that's the, the <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, let's let's see let's see here we go. When the priest hears your prayers and and then he gives you penance in order to have your sins absolved, you go to the altar rail, you start oh, receiving your prayers. Stop. Many of them are prayers no. to Mary. No, course, no. <laughs> <laughs> penance in order to get your sins absolved <laughs> yeah okay so um no um it, it, interestingly enough by the way um in, in the eastern catholic tradition we we generally don't have penances assigned during conversion hmm. Um, and obviously we have absolutions. <laughs> um, uh, now in the, in the, uh, Latin rite, generally a, a penance is, is supposed to be assigned canonically. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not in order to, um, gain absolution. Right. Um, in fact, in order to even do penance, really, um, it would already presume absolution. So, no, you don't have to do penance in order to be absolved. That that's yeah. simply not true. Yeah, yeah. You as know, the catechumen is saying there, um, yeah, the penance uh, absolution comes before penance. It, it it's really funny too because I know I, I, like you said in the in the east, like there's a lot of times I guess whenever there is no penance assigned, um, but like there's this tendency for people to want like harsh penances and whatnot. And uh, the priest in uh, at, at my church has said because he's had people. At, like he'll assign them what they perceive to be a too light of a penance. And he's like, no, 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 go ahead. And he's like, no, give me one harder, something that's more befitting for my sins. And he's just like, very well, uh, for your penance, you must go onto a cross. You have to get nails driven through your hands and through your feet. And you go up there and you die. That is what's fitting for your sins. 
and yeah. uh and it is just like oh, i don't want to do that it's like okay well then cool then do the first thing that i told you to do then like, right. <laughs> right. but how how could you engage catholics for over 30 years and, and not know this it's yeah. it's let me give you an example if i were to tell you that i have been working um as a contractor i've been working with mcdonald's for 30 years as a contractor mm. and and i and i were to you know have a conversation with you and i start describing mcdonald's to you and i describe it as this really large bookstore that sells <laughs> books and animal plushies and all kinds of videos and cds and old records and they don't have any food or drink there, but they have, well, they might have some candy here and there, but they sell keychains, they sell book stands, you know, <laughs> obviously I'm talking about, I'm talking about books a million here, right? Not talking about right. McDonald's, but if I described McDonald's in that way, you would clearly know, all right, this, this person is either lying or he, he, you know, he's has a serious, you know, comprehension problem. There, there's something wrong here. Like clearly, he's not describing McDonald's. So, is it possible to be a contractor doing? I don't know what the work would be. Anything? Is it possible to do anything for McDonald's for thirty years and not know the very basics of what McDonald's is? That it's a, yeah, food, that, a fast food restaurant, right? That that's one um, of those like you would have to have never stepped foot inside of one. That, that's what I'm saying. Like, so this is what this is the problem with Mike is the way he describes Catholicism, it's exactly like that analogy that I gave to you. Mm -hmm. Which, again, my, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. How does this happen that you've been engaging Catholicism for this long and you're saying these things? How, how does this work? Yeah. I don't yeah. understand. Well, I mean, I guess it's one of those things, and, and this is just a possibility. It's not the guaranteed thing, um, but it's just one of those whenever what you're doing is working and you keep getting the money rolling in, I mean, why why should you change if that's what you're... I don't think that he has to... Yeah, I don't think he has to engage Catholics because it's not necessary for him to do what he's doing with his audience. Yeah, it's yeah. Because they don't know their left from their right about Catholicism. They don't know the difference, the vast majority right. of them. So, it, you know... And yeah, I'm sure. It, I'm sure it checks out for them because yeah. they generally already have that preconceived bias against Catholicism, and a lot of them tend to want to hear something critical about Catholicism. So they're mm -hmm. more than happy to hear what they're hearing from him. Well, yeah, and like I, I, I don't know if you've ever engaged any of uh, Bruce Mejia's stuff before, but like I've even heard like his thing is he was just like, well, why is the priest doing this? It's like, oh, because it's they're all drunk, and it's just like. Well, I mean, I imagine there's been at least one priest in church history that celebrated a mass while intoxicated. But like every single one of them, every single time, like that's a little ridiculous. But yet, like whenever he's saying that, like the congregation's going like, yeah, amen. Amen. And, and so praise yeah, your so, pastor. Yeah, exactly. So and I was like, I think that's what we got, what we got going on here. So but let's see if we've got another nugget in store for us here. So I found out later that there's no way anywhere in the Bible a godly man prays to anyone other than God because God's the only one that can hear our prayer. Oh, so whenever huh. the, the guests at the wedding feast of Cana asked Mary about the wine situation, like they, they, they weren't actually wanting her intercession. I guess they were just complaining. Did he say that nobody in the Bible has ever praised anyone other than God? Is prayed to. I think oh. here, let's go back and, and double check that. You go to the altar rail, you start reciting your prayers and many of them are prayers to Mary. And of course I found out later that there's no way anywhere in the Bible, a godly man prays to anyone other than God. Cause yeah, God, no, no, yeah. He never, never to, uh, I yeah. See. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I would point out that if you look at sacred scripture, you have the angels presenting the prayers of the saints to God in heaven. And, why would they be presenting the prayers of the saints to God unless they have some kind of intercessory role? Um, it's not that they're just merely praying for the people on earth. They are presenting the prayers of the saints to God.
right the prayers of the saints not just the angels praying for the people on earth the prayers of the saints yeah that assumes intercessory prayer on part of those who are in heaven yeah at the very least angels um but there's no reason to believe that the saints wouldn't also have the same uh function given that they're aware of what's going on on earth according to revelation and hebrews so um you don't have to find a direct verse where it says so and so prayed to a saint or something like that as as long as first of all i, I do think he's assuming solo scripture here but let's table that for a moment let's just go ahead and engage him on his own terms um if scripture assumes intercessory prayer that's sufficient i don't have to show any instance of somebody praying to a saint i just simply have to show the fact that it's a phenomenon that it exists and it's necessarily so through what we see in the book of revelation yeah yeah father john even points out you know god deals with everyone through intercessions like every time like jesus doesn't even hand out the multiplied uh lobes himself so yeah i think it's uh is it revelation 5 8 let's go to Let's see. Let's see. Well, in this case, um, it's the twenty-four elders. But yeah, in, in another verse, it is the um, uh, the angels. But the twenty-four elders fell down mm -hmm. before the Lamb, each holding a harp, golden bowl full of incense, and which are the prayers of the saints. Let me see the angels, though. Let's see. Yeah. I forget which verse it is. I, th I thought it was Revelation 8, but I, is 8 4? Yeah. I think so. Let's see. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Here, let me show my screen. Sweet. Oh, yeah. So while you're, while you're pulling that up, oh, there, never mind. There we go. All right. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So the angel is presenting the prayers of the saints to God. Again, he's not just praying to God. He's presenting their prayers prayers to god that is an odd thing to do that just simply i don't see how it could be explained other than an intercessory role right first yeah. of all the angel is aware of the prayers of the saints so he knows what's going on on earth so you can't say well we don't know that those are in heaven even know what's going on they do uh it also doesn't require them to be omniscient you know, they'll, some of them will say, well, it requires them to be omniscient, to hear everyone's prayers at, at all at once. No, it doesn't. Um, and they're able to still, even though they're not omniscient as angels, they're still able to offer the prayers to God. Yeah. I don't see yeah. a way to get around that. I'd love to hear Gendron's take on it. You know, it, it's, I've heard it, you know, this is just an accusation. Of course, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a, um, this isn't a knock, a knock against Protestantism in, in general, but it is a knock against, uh, you know, like Mike Gendron and, and other apologists who are in that line of thought of like, they actually don't know scripture all that well. They've got like 14 verses memorized. And the moment you step out of like those 14 verses, that's the moment that like you really expose that like actually their understanding is rather shallow. Now, I don't yeah. know if that's what's actually going on here, but like on your day to day interactions, that's kind of it's usually what, exactly what's going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there's often a profound ignorance of, of Scripture on part of Protestants. Yeah. 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 So let's see if we can find a little bit more of that profound ignorance here. That's the only one that can hear our prayers. But um, this whole concept of penance and purgatory and indulgences, I look back now and I say that was a way to control people. And ultimately, that's what religion... Okay. So now we're assuming intention here. Like mm -hmm. it... All these ideas were just to control the people, 
-hmm. not because it's true, not because we sincerely believe it to be true. It's just to control people. Yeah, I um I find this interesting because I know some atheists who would use this exact argument against him and his belief of scripture. They would say, "Oh, the Bible was just written by men to control humans." Yeah. You know, um this is not a paid advertisement, but you know, Trent Trent Horn's got a book out, you know, when Protestants argue like atheists, and I think that's like I haven't actually ordered that book today. <laughs> I actually never read it. But like that that sounds exactly like what's going on here. Mhm. Mm so, but yeah, but anyway, let's see, let's see what else we got. It does, it controls the people. And I love what Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Yeah, okay, so hold on. He literally just said religion controls the people. Like that's literally an atheist talking point that I've heard like from multiple atheists. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could just be turned right back around on him. Of course, yeah, he's exactly. defining his version of Christianity against religion. He doesn't consider his version to be religion. Uh, well, I mean, it it all depends on how we're defining religion then, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, you know, and I suppose like the atheist would basically just say, like, do you believe in a God? Yes. Do you believe that that demands a response of you? Yes. That's a religion. Religion. Yeah. So like, boom. So, but anyway, the, uh, yeah, let's see what else we got. Free, free from this religious control. I exchanged my religion for a relationship with Christ. And when God granted me repentance, I turned from believing the false plan of salvation that the Catholic Church had taught me, and I believe the true gospel of Christ. And and by true gospel of Christ, he means like some rando's interpretation from like, you know, whatever. Well, you know, every heretic in the world says the exact same thing that Kendrick is saying. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, just saying it doesn't make it true. Yeah. You know, you find that like I, I was, I was, you know, uh, talking to somebody who was, uh, you know, discerning all of this thing. It was like, well, is it Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy? Because it's like that, the, the Spider Man meme of like everybody pointing at everybody else. And it was like, no, you departed from the true faith. And it's just like, okay, cool. So everybody departed from the true faith. So what do you do with that? Like, yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I yeah. yeah, every heretic in the world can say exactly what Gendron is saying. And I would ask how he distinguishes himself from them. And of course, he'll say scripture. But what are they going to say? They're also going to say scripture. So, well, yeah. So it's just like, I guess one of those things, like, what if I what if I told uh, Mike Gendron is like, hey, I, I, too, have also gone cover to cover with the Bible. And I have come to the conclusion that like Catholicism is by far the most reasonable, uh, you know, you know, system that like culminates all of this together to where it all makes sense. And you know, well, like what what would he say to that? He's just like, well, you got to read the Bible. It's like, I just told you I did read the Bible. So now what? Like, how do I get to where you are? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could say the exact same thing he said. Yeah, yeah. So now my life has literally been turned upside down. Shortly after the Lord saved me, I look for a Bible believing church because I was like a a sponge in the desert. I just wanted to soak up God's word. I wanted to, to go wherever the word was taught. And I remember after I... And I feel like this this almost sounds like like a, uh, a new Muslim convert story too. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I, I realized that the, the falsehoods and I was just a sponge. Like, you know, it's just kind of like a knowledge vacuum of like, I have nothing in my head. So I'm just going to reach out to whatever I can grab. And like, you mentioned it earlier it could have been islam it could have been you know the yeah, lds whatever yeah I've, I've i've been doing this for too long to not have heard this a million times from a million different perspectives and so there's really nothing that distinguishes what mike is doing here from somebody who converts to mormonism or islam yeah, yeah it's 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 one of those <laughs> it's just like hey you know what does mike gendron and sneeko have in common and it's this and if anybody's been following that stupid story, <laughs> I don't know that. Yeah, don't. It's not a story worth looking into. So okay. anyway, let's okay. keep going. Find a Bible believing church in Dallas. I was still in the corporate world and I find myself in five different Bible studies every morning of the week. <laughs> Before I go to work, I go to a Bible study just to learn more of God's word. Is that why? Like the reason I wanted to ask you, you got me thinking about the way the Catholic Church was. And those you, you said Sunday, you heard it in the Sunday message every week. What was the difference between the Catholic sermon? And sitting there doing whatever it is you do, maybe you could even help us understand what happens at a mass. Yeah. So it's just like, this is a, 
this is like that that difference between like a Baptist service and like any and this isn't this isn't just Catholics. It's just any liturgical. It's just like oh, it's the Catholic sermon. It's like well, the sermon is arguably the the homily is arguably the least important part of the entire liturgy. Like it's the sacrifice, and you know that's that's like the real like meat and potatoes of the liturgy. And like whatever the priest has to say, you know, it oftentimes has great fruit into it. But like, if like the priest just de delivers an absolute dud of a homily, that doesn't invalidate anything. Which I mean, if I were a priest, I would take great comfort in that. But like, yeah. So he's just like, "What do you do in a Catholic sermon?" So I'm I'm curious to see what Mike says that you're supposed to do during a mass. Yeah, let's see it. And now you're in five Bible studies a week just because you want God's word. What's the contrast there? Well, the Catholic Church, actually, they say they go through the Bible every three years, but it's really not true. I never heard Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in the Catholic Church. I Let's, I don't know. In, if there's a good... I'm pretty sure it's in the liturgical cycle. Yeah, I don't know if there's a quick way to look that up or not, because it's just like, I never heard it. And it's just like, well, Mike, you obviously didn't hear a lot of stuff. So, like, that might be a true statement, but only because he wasn't listening. I don't think that he is accurate on this. Let me see. Let's see here. I'm going to uh, see. It's like we're already what? like two. two oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, wh while you do that, I'm going to step away for just a second here. I'm going to give me something to drink. Okay. Well, cool. Well, you go do that, and I will uh, – here. I'm going to pull you off here. There we go. Um so while while he's doing that, y'all wanna if y'all wanna have any questions or like comments, whatever, I will do that. And if anybody also like if anybody can like look that up real quick too, so that way I'm not having to like manage the stream, try to talk and not keep too much dead air. Um, so what we're looking into right now is to find out if anywhere in the liturgy um, that Ephesians two eight and nine appears anywhere in there. So. Um, yeah. So, oh, cool. So, Braden's looking up in uh, Verbum now to see if uh, Ephesians two is mentioned anywhere in the in the liturgy. Now, I mean, I'm just gonna. So, obviously, I don't have the three year cycle memorized. Um, you know, I, I I guess that makes me a terrible Catholic. That I'm not I'm not doing enough to work for my own salvation. Um, but um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, the. Uh, but yeah, it, it. I don't know. It's just such a. It's such a, a, a shallow. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Michael's back. Yeah. Uh, we didn't find it. I know Braden's looking into it in verbum. So until I'm gonna just kind of leave him on to that, just to see if that does appear in the liturgy. Oh, yep. Here we go. It uh, fourth Sunday in Lent, year B. I was even gonna say it might just appear in a, uh, in a, uh, in a daily mass, but no, it actually fourth Sunday of Lent. Um, yeah, so, so, okay. That just means that Mike wasn't paying attention on every single Sunday. So to say that it's not there is disingenuous. <laughs> Golly. Um, but, but even if it weren't for some reason, I mean, you're still supposed to be reading scripture as well. Um, mass isn't the like full extent of your devotional. Uh, devotional right. you that that should be one thing and some could even argue like the most central of your week but you should still be doing plenty of other things during the week as well yeah and i guess it's scriptures <laughs> now i understand that mike doesn't think that catholics are supposed to treat you know god as having you know an actual relationship but it's one of those things of like you are required to go to sunday Sunday mass. And, you know, there's a few other precepts that you like, you're, you're required to do as a Catholic, but like, that's just the bare minimum. Like, what if I told you that like, in order to be a husband, these are the bare minimum things that you have to do. Like, do you think that your wife would swoon at like, yeah, speaking? just don't cheat. Yeah. yeah don't I mean, cheat. You're, 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 don't cheat and don't hit her and you're good. Yeah, exactly. And it's just like, as long as I'm not being an infidel or, you know, it, you know and conducting myself in infidelity and, and, uh, you know, you're good doing man. all these other things. Like, I guess that makes me a good husband. It's like, no, you can still be a lazy piece of crap on the couch. Like, right. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So, 
but uh yeah 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 mm, yeah what do you say oh. to this <laughs> He's been, been saying uh, he missed it because he was at his Bible studies. But for daily mass, it's ordinary time, week 29, Monday, year two. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right. I never heard 2 Corinthians 5.21. In some, not doing that again. Even though they say that, and they go through a, a portion of the gospel, maybe five or six verses. They'll go through an Old Testament verse. Maybe What? Only five or six verses in the gospel? That's not been my experience. I, um, again... I have to ask the question, how does this happen? Yeah. How does, it, how does this happen? Yeah. Uh, I, I, Drew, Drew's suggesting that, you know, it could just be that he was snoring during the reading. So, um, you know, that would, that would, you know, make sense. So, so I, I have a, I have a um, hypothesis here. So Mike was poorly educated, did not really pay attention at mass didn't really bother to understand much about the faith. He encounters somebody who opens up their Bible and, you know, throws them for a loop. And he thinks that he has now discovered the truth and he leaves the Catholic church and goes to a Bible believing church. Amen. So, amen. Uh, so the, my theory is that's what happened. He was poorly educated did not make much of an effort to learn about the faith, did not pay attention at mass. And now he, as an apologist for his perspective, is trying to make himself look like a credible source for Catholicism to better convince people towards his position. Because if he were to present himself as poorly educated, didn't really take the faith seriously, didn't really receive much formation or bother to form himself. Um, would, would he would he be able to do the ministry that he's doing if he just you know presented himself that way? I don't know, probably not. So yeah. I kind of feel like he has to build himself up and speak of himself as this you know credible source. When for anybody who actually is a credible source and knows what Catholicism is about, they realize, yeah, this isn't true. Yeah. I, it is a form of bearing false witness. But I think that that's why this is happening, is, is he's just trying to, again, make himself look like a credible source. Yeah. Well, I mean, after all, he was an altar boy. So, you well, know. That might just, you know, that you know, that I just credit everything I just said. So, I, you know, and I think, I think it's really just like it's kind of one of those like you've got your normal priests, you've got your bishops, you've got the pope, then you've got doctors of the church, and then above all of that is altar boys. I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's how that works. I think the altar boys is a notch up from doctor of the church. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that 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 that's why that's his expertise here. <laughs> so. The highest office of the church. I, I think the altar boys had a hand in writing the new catechism. Mm. I thought they had a, actually like had a hand in writing the gospel itself. So, well, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe the ones that we use during liturgy, because evidently we don't use the same Bible that he uses. Oh, he keeps yeah. Quoting, he keeps quoting the Bible to us as if we've never heard of it before. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going. <laughs> Be a psalm or a proverb, but the mass is really all ritual. It's um, a representation of Jesus Christ on an altar. That's why they call it the sacrifice of the mass. So, I mean, fair, okay, like it's 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 just a ritual, as if that's a bad thing. But it's just like he said, representation. Very good. Okay, fantastic. He actually got something right there. A uh, sacrifice of the mass. A uh, fantastic. That's great. But now let's see why he says that this is all a bad thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, by the way, Catholics are forced to go to mass every Sunday under the penalty of mortal sin, because they're going to participate in the representation of Christ on an altar, even though he said he finished it. OK. Oh, on the cross, John 1930. OK, so he's saying like, oh, he, he, he finished it on the cross. Why don't you, you want to take a stab at that one before I launch into mine? Yeah, what he finished is um, the bloody sacrifice, and we do believe that's finished. We don't yeah. believe that Jesus has 
blood spewing all over our altars every uh every sunday um obviously that bloody sacrifice is once and for all um we do have the book of hebrews we have read it we're aware of that um but we do make a distinction between the bloody sacrifice and an unbloody representation of that sacrifice and so this is not something that we've just come up with it's that distinction is right there explicitly and plenty of the church fathers which he says he doesn't read um so it's it's also implied in the book of malachi and the prophecy in the book of malachi chapter Ooh. one uh that in every place a sacrifice will be offered um the earliest christians interpreted malachi chapter one to refer to the eucharist Ooh. they believed everywhere the eucharistic sacrifice would be offered even the didache being written while the apostles are still alive um explicitly points to malachi one as a prophecy of the eucharistic sacrifice Obviously, the Eucharistic sacrifice is not a bloody sacrifice. It's a representation in an unbloody manner of that right. one sacrifice that is finished. So, um, there, again, there's no problem. We, we don't have an issue of harmonizing these things. It's pretty consistent from day one what, what the Catholic position is. Again, as evidenced by the Didache and Malachi. So, uh, I, I don't know. These are just the same arguments over and over and over and over and over. It's just <laughs> tell me they, you don't understand can Catholic come, theology. Can they come up with something new? <laughs> All they do is repeat the traditions of men that they learned from others who indoctrinated them with the same ridiculous arguments. Boom. Boom. Catholics continue it on an altar. And so it's called a propitiatory sacrifice. It, it's propitiatory in the sense that God's wrath is turned away from the sins that were committed in the previous week by the Catholics that are gathered at mass. What? So the, um, we would say that the Eucharistic sacrifice, um, is not somehow propitiatory in and of itself, like apart from the sacrifice of Calvary, it's mm -hmm. a representation of the same sacrifice. And so, um, speaking of it as propitiatory is, is in a derogatory way is to somehow assume that somehow it's separate from, um, that original sacrifice at Calvary. Um, I don't see what the problem here is. The one sacrifice of Christ is propitiatory. And if the Eucharist makes present that once and for all sacrifice in our midst, if it makes it present then it would follow that that propitiatory aspect is present as well um so i and i would point out also in the new testament the concept of anamnesis or remembrance uh that you find when jesus says do this in remembrance of me um is the term there that's used in greek isn't just a recalling a past event but makes the past event present. And this harkens back to the Passover, where the same concept was used there. Whenever they celebrated the Passover, the Israelites, the Passover was made present to them in the Passover lamb. Uh, so the same applies here. So again, I, I just don't see an issue here, since it logically follows if the Eucharistic sacrifice is an unbloody representation or making manifest and present to us the once and for all sacrifice of christ of course it would be propitiatory in nature but it's not propitiatory in nature somehow separate from calvary as if what happened two thousand years ago isn't sufficient so we have to re-crucify jesus every sunday yeah that that's or it's a, just like that's a straw man or or like you know specifically saying like like oh this sacrifice is just for all the sins that you committed in the past week like that that just seems i don't know like that that that's that that seems spectacularly dumb again you have an individual who's trying to present himself as a credible source and he's anything but that yeah but if well, he I, admitted that he wasn't a credible source it would ruin his ministry yeah, yeah. it's like uh Hen's uncle here 
Um, if his uncle admitted that he's a fraud and a charlatan, it would pretty much ruin all the donations that are coming into him. Man, I'll have to look into that because I have no idea who his uncle is. I've never heard of him prior to that. Or I think you I've don't heard know the name. Benny Hinn. I don't know anything about Benny Hinn. You other don't than... know Benny Hinn. What? How? You don't I know mean, Benny Hinn. Well, so you got to realize, like, whenever I converted, I was 18, and I was kind of a not a great Protestant. So when we were talking about, like, oh, you know, the, the best Protestants become Catholic, but, you know, the worst Catholics become Protestants, it's like, okay, I am the exception to that rule in the direction of, like, Protestant to Catholic. So, yeah. <laughs> I did not know. You did not know who Vinny Ann was. Yeah. So you know Creflo it, Dollar, Kenneth Copeland? Yeah, no, I know, I know Creflo Dollar and Kenneth Copeland, yeah. So, I mean, he's a charlatan along those lines. Oh, okay. I mean, he runs in that crew. Okay. Yeah, he's the same crew. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, well, I mean, I think that just tells me. Never seen Benny Hinn let the bodies hit the floor? Oh, he's that guy. With with his uh, suit, knocking people down with the suit. Oh, oh. And and this is his nephew. Oh. Yeah, that's his uncle. (laughs) <laughs> he makes millions and millions and millions of dollars pimping people out of their money by fake healing people. He's a shark. Oh, man, that's that's so, you know, it's funny. Like, so shortly after I started, uh, you know, managing uh, some of the stuff on the Council of Trent, uh, his video on Kenneth Copeland just took off like out of nowhere. And like, so I monitor the comments. I see most comments that like come through there and you would be shocked at the number of people that are like, you shouldn't attack Kenneth Copeland. He treat peaches, the true gospel. And it's like, touch not mine anointed. Yeah, Yeah. basically. And it's just like, what? Oh, I didn't think that there were people like this. Oh, (laughs) I've met them. I remember the first time. In fact, I think I was criticizing Benny Hinn to this person when I was still Protestant. Uh, I was at a Baptist church and I was criticizing Benny Hinn or somebody else in that category. And this, you know, Baptist lady scripture says the Bible says touch not mine anointed. And she got on to me. The answer to your question. She got on to me for daring to speak about the Lord's anointed. (laughs) (laughs) we're so delusional and brainwashed is you just can't have a reasonable conversation with them so what i mean what do you say to that if a person honestly thinks this is a person anointed by god i'm sorry no amount of reason is going to help that person that that's one of those like well i hope you're right have a good day like yeah i don't i I used to waste my time on on, i I'll no longer, and I haven't in years, I no longer try to um, persuade such people. You just can't reason with them. Yeah, yeah. Other, yeah. other things in life will teach them the errors of their ways, but reason will. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, so Ben saying, you know, Costi Hand became big by rejecting his uncle's ministry, which, I mean, good for him, but yeah. he's only in these conversations because of his uncle. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I that that's true. I've I've seen several of his videos where he re- completely exposes his uncle. I think he actually worked with them for a little while. Oh um, well, and, and good for him for speaking up against that. I, yeah, I, but you know, yeah. <laughs> obviously, I, I I do think he has some deficiencies here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got Enoch in the chat. He's saying, Jesus, give up everything and follow me." And Copeland responds, "What you're saying is, I need a third plane." <laughs> But people will still donate to these people and think that it's this is the way it is. This is godly behavior. Goodness. Again, All right, let's we can't reason with such people. Let's see. Let's see if we can get something else out of here. Here we go. And I heard very little of the Bible. It was a repetitious offering of Christ on the altar. And um... okay, hold on. So first off, he did say representation, but he's like the the repetitious offering. So it's just like what. Oh, just oh, goodness. Okay, so, so we are. If we're, if we're making the distinction between an unbloody offering and a uh, bloody offering, and the unbloody offering is not somehow distinct or separate or adding to uh, the once and for all offering, then sure. But, um, you know, it, he is aware that Jesus continually to offers himself to God the Father according to the book of Hebrews, right? I mean, 
Mm. He continually offers himself. No, it was, so it was, if, it was, if he's it was, going to criticize a continual offering, like wouldn't wouldn't that criticize what Jesus is continually doing? Once again, you better let Jesus know because he's wrong to do what he's doing. Apparently, let let me see if I can find the verse here. Okay, let's see here. While we're doing that, let's see here. What what, what else we got here? Uh. Oh, yeah, a lot of people, uh, I guess the other Paul is saying that the, his favorite Benny Hinn meme was uh, the Sith electricity. So I've got some, I've got, it sounds like I've got some homework to do tonight. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, boy. It, I it's, have to find the verse. I don't want to spend too much time trying to dig for it, but. <laughs> Benny Hinn, God said I needed a new Rolex. Well, you know, they do hold their value quite well. Um, let's see here. So he also said he heard very little of the Bible and that we only read a couple of gospel verses and one Old Testament verse. I'll be honest, I'm not sure he ever attended Mass despite what he claims. Either that or he was just picking his nose up in the sanctuary while he was supposedly altar serving. I'll have to find it, maybe put it in the chat in the comment section or something but yeah yeah so let's see here as i was studying the bible i i came to hebrews chapter 9 chapter 10 and those chapters just totally destroy the roman catholic mass because you know it's fascinating because if i remember correctly hebrews was one of the books that like martin luther actually wanted to get rid of um because of like how heavy it is like in support of the mass Mm -hmm. so like you know i you know we could we could probably pull up like chapter nine chapter ten whatever and go through that i don't know it right off the top of my head but like you know i i refer to uh you know whenever it talks about like we need continual sacrifices somebody you know pointed if this was in the cross the tiber server somebody pointed out like yeah but we don't need to offer sacrifices anymore but then i i, I pointed out in hebrews like it specifically says we have an altar like what is an altar for an altar isn't so that you can isn't for just for altar calls and getting married. Like it's for sacrifice. That's his, that's its primary goal. It's like, we have an altar for which they cannot like eat from. And I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that specific uh, reference right off the top of my head, but it's yeah. just like, yeah. Well, you also have Hebrews 13 that says we continually offer a sacrifice of praise. Um, now, obviously sacrifice of praise is distinct from the sacrifice um, of Jesus. 2000 years ago however they are not separated though they're distinct the sacrifice of praise is is only uh acceptable to god because of what jesus did because yeah. of his atonement and his sacrifice but it's continuous i mean we continue to offer according to hebrews 13 continually offer that sacrifice of praise um yeah i wonder if that causes a problem for mike wouldn't he say that, oh, no, what Jesus did 2,000 years ago is settled and done. It's finished. So why do you need to continue to offer this sacrifice of praise? Yeah. 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 So let's see. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Because you read in Hebrews 10 that he offered himself once for all sin for all time. And by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. And, and so... Right. Roman Catholic. Yeah, yes, in, in a in a bloody way he offered himself absolutely uh once and for all. But that's a little different than in um in an unbloody way in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Those are distinct, but he continually makes intercession for us according to Hebrews 7. He continually intercedes for us. And and I would ask how? How does he continually intercede other than by being continually that one perfect offering mm. does is he a one perfect offering and he ceases to be that offering like so he just stopped being that offering two thousand years ago or does he continue to be that offering forever but yeah. as being a living embodiment like the, the he still has the wounds currently so wouldn't he as he's continually making intercession be a continuous offering yeah maybe not in a bloody manner but um okay yeah 
Let's let's go. Catholics really need to read those chapters, Hebrews nine and Hebrews ten. I agree. Catholics do need to read those chapters. I, 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 that you know what? That's actually pretty solid advice. Now, don't just read those chapters. Like, please read them, you know, in their proper context and commentary. If you know, you you know, you feel a little shaky, which I would recommend. But you know, Bible in a year, Father Mike Schmitz, go for it. it but all those and passages in Hebrew are talking about a bloody sacrifice, and so when we make the distinction between a bloody and unbloody sacrifice, it just shows that Hebrews doesn't negate what we're saying. Yeah. Because we're, we're making that distinction because again, we have the book of Hebrews in our canon. We're aware of that. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, we, we are aware of that. We've had it, you know, since it was written and like for the vast majority, this might come as a shock to some people. I said it at the beginning, but you know, some of y'all may be joining late. So I'll repeat this. This might come as a shock, but the vast majority of church history predates the television um shocker i know um but like you know the 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 church people in the church especially theologians priests whatever who especially the ones that took like vows of celibacy you know didn't have video games didn't have tv didn't have a lot of distractions there's as many distractions as we have today so to think that like the church hasn't accounted for literally every single verse in scripture is I, man, like that, that's such a weird assumption to take. It's like, so you, you yourself, who's gone cover to cover with the Bible, you don't think that a single Catholic theologian did that for like a thousand years prior to like the, the, the Protestant Reformation? That's. Oh, well, I don't, I don't think that he's honestly trying to give Catholicism a fair shake to think it through that thoroughly. Not yeah. that that's rare. Yeah. Not that that in and of itself is very thorough. What you're saying is very reasonable, but it is just such a basic thing. Um, yeah. Like that's just the bare minimum. Um, of you, you would think, of course, he would have done that. Well, no, not necessarily. I don't think he's even given us the very basics here. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think he's trying to give us a fair shake here. Yeah. I guess it's just one of those things of like, you know, if, if, um, you know, I'm saying this because I found out that Veritas is apparently watching this with his 13 year old, and it's just like, oh crap, I have adults trusting me with their children. Okay, so, um, but anyway, the um, it, it's it's you gotta like walk this out a little bit. I'm like, okay, so if what you're saying is true, this would have had to have happened, and it's just like, oh, the the Catholic Church doesn't know about these verses. Like that is one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard in my life because just the 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 borderline miraculous well, amount of stupidity that would have to happen do you well keep in mind their level of church history and understanding of church history is so superficial that in their mind they think that well the bible was chained for all these years and yeah. it was in a different language so most catholics couldn't read the bible and so they just didn't know what was in there and the protestant reformers just rediscovered it at all so that's kind of their view of church history. So they're not really thinking through it in any kind of fair terms. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fair. But, you know, I think that, I think just like these kind of challenges are helpful for like those who are currently in the pews now that when they meet these, these challenges, um, it's just one of those uh, like, Hey, this is, this is, this is one of those things that should be setting off alarm bells in your head of like, don't take this guy seriously or somebody Who's, you know, I mean, I feel like if you were, you know, almost two hours, 45 minutes into this, if you made it this far, you know that Mike Gendron shouldn't be taken seriously now and forever. And, and it's forever. just like, yeah. And now it, and forever and forever. I'm in. Yeah. Um, it, but it's just like, but if you hear somebody like repeating these kinds of things, it's just like, okay, stop and think about it for just a second. And the moment that you apply more than two seconds of thought, like it falls apart rather quickly. So, yeah, yeah, it's, let's let's do one more. I got to head out here in a minute. I was about to say, let's like, go through like, one last last. I'll be honest, here. Mike, you you st you stuck around longer than I thought you were Isn't going. That to. Right? <laughs> yeah. All gotta, right. I got to head out here in a second. Let's, yeah. let's do one more round, though. One more. Recognize that the ongoing sacrifice of Christ on an altar is superfluous. It's actually blasphemy. It's an okay. So saying Gosh. that the sacrifice that that is owed to God is blasphemy. Okay, cool. So, you know, if he's wrong here, then what he has just called 
of blasphemous is the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. If he's mm. one, that's a there's some high stakes here. Um, you know, if if you're wrong, you just blasphemed. And you really insulted the precious sacrifice of Christ. It's it's like whenever you know Protestants they do everything they can to tarnish the Virgin Mary. Yeah. Um, in contrast with Catholicism, they do everything they can to just drag her through the mud. And it's high stakes because if if you're wrong, you've insulted the mother of Jesus. I don't know how well that's gonna go on the day of judgment. But hey, I guess one save always saves, so you can just do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I guess it doesn't matter at that point. But yeah, okay. no. But that, that's one of those things of like to, to 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 utter that sort of blasphemy is is it's I don't know. Like I'm kind of thinking of like it's almost like going on a roulette table and just like betting your house on you know red seventeen or whatever. You know, I don't know which which one's odd or even. But like, uh, yeah, it's just like you might you might be right. Chances are, like I don't know. Like I wouldn't bet the house on something like on something like that I not would, without doing an extreme amount of research yeah i would i would mitigate the claim and if i were critiquing catholics and instead of pulling the blasphemy card i would just say this seems to undermine the sacrifice of grace i would just say that but i wouldn't call it blasphemy because if you're wrong you just it's kind of like the pharisees whenever they um said that jesus was casting out demons by the power of satan um, if you're wrong about that, you just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Do, do you really want to take that risk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Just saying. No, I don't know if that was a good idea. Uh, so as a, uh, I guess as a final conclusion, if, mm -hmm. if, uh, as we, as we, as we step away from here and step away from this video and I'm probably not going to like ever like finish this because like the points <laughs> have been thoroughly made. Um, but like, if you could sum up in a sentence, like what you want everybody who's watching this now and in the future to walk away with, what what would, what would you say? People who are non-Catholics or people who are Catholics? Just anybody who's watching the video. So I guess like give give me a Catholic one and a, and and one for the Protestant viewers. For for Catholics, I would strongly um, point out that. Gendron is not a credible source on Catholicism and um, probably isn't also the best representative. I'm, I'm sorry. He's not a credible source on Catholicism and also isn't the best representative of Protestantism either. Um, and I would say, listen to any of the million responses that have been offered to all of these arguments. Um, a good place to start would just be Catholic answers because there uh, is just an infinite amount of videos and articles there answering these same questions every single week um in fact they have callers who call in every single week asking these same questions that, that are answered again on a weekly basis that's how common they are um so that's what i would say to non-catholics and to catholics well uh what i would say to them is i, I hope you enjoy this for entertainment because I'm, i imagine <laughs> if you're a catholic watching this you already know that he's in air and so I just I, I hope you weren't frustrated the whole time and you just enjoyed this as entertainment. Um, if, if, so, if for some reason you're a Catholic who's not catechized, I encourage you to, number one, go to sacred scripture and read the Bible cover to cover and then read the catechism cover to cover. And I think that will help give you some good formation. Fantastic. Well, everybody, thank you for uh, for coming to our second longest low hanging fruit stream ever. <laughs> Uh, though we, we, not the, uh, longest video we've ever responded to, but, uh, thanks for sticking around y'all. God bless.